We are live. Thank you. At this time, would all sergeants please start their recordings? Computer recording started. Thank you. Cloud recording started. Thank you. Backup has started. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committees of Economic Development jointly with the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos for verification. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. All right, thank you so much. To start this hearing. Good morning, everyone. I know it is a very busy time of year and we are all focused on many of our priorities, but thank you for spending some time today at our virtual hearing where we will be discussing workforce development and combating unemployment. My name is Paul Ballone. I am chair of the Committee on Economic Development. And today we are honored to have my dear friend, co-chair from Small Business Council Member Mark Joni. We are joined by council members Barron, Lewis, Perkins, and Rosenthal. And there will be new council members coming and going. So for the folks that are watching, at times you will hear them speak on issues within their district or questions on today's topic. Uh, I will start us off with a, just a brief opening and turn it over to my co-chair for his opening. Today, hearing marks the third opportunity that we in the council have had time and opportunity to hear testimony from the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development on an office that was created in 2014 with the goal of transforming the city's workforce development strategies by coordinating and improving the city's many workforce development programs. The focus of today's hearing will be check on how these initiatives from the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, the Economic Development Corporation and the Department of Small Business have adapted to the challenging circumstances created by COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the plans lie ahead for the various for the city's various workforce development programs. A lot of today, from my point of view, will be getting everyone on board for the work that we've heard before pandemic, what has happened since we've been in this crisis since March, and what the plan will be for the new year in 2021, which we all can't wait to get going. Uh, but first, for a little background, in 2014, the Office of Workforce Development's Career Pathways Plan outlined a shift in the city's workforce development strategy from so-called rapid attachment programs, which presented limited opportunities for upward mobility, to a new type of system that would partner with industries to help job seekers build the skills employers seek, improve the quality of work, and most importantly for today's hearing, increase accountability among city agencies that conduct job training programs to ensure people who emerge from these programs are able to find work. In the first five years of the so since, I guess, since the original the Career Pathways framework was created, the city's economy set records in both sheer numbers of jobs as well as the lowest unemployment levels since the 2008 financial crisis. In October 2019, the city unemployment rate was a healthy 3.6%. Then, as we know, when the pandemic hit in March, all that growth came to a screeching halt. According to the New York State Department of Labor, in the year from October 2019 to October 2020, the city has lost nearly 554,000 jobs. That's over a half a million New Yorkers that are now out of work. And while the unemployment rate has recovered a bit, if we want to call it that, since it spiked in 20.4% in June, the rate remains at a discouraging 13.2%, and as Councilmember Joe and I will talk about, it is almost a 20% still in the Bronx, nearly 10% higher than the year before. While job losses have spread out across all of our industries, the hardest hit sectors were the leisure and hospitality, which we've had hearings on before in this committee, which saw over 200,000 job losses alone and growing to date. Considering the nature of how COVID-19 has been transmitted, it comes as no surprise that these face-to-face -face industries have suffered the most during this crisis. In its most recent update to the Career Pathways Plan, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development outlined the impact of the pandemic upon the city's workforce development infrastructure and how the city's low-income communities have suffered the hardest, both from job losses and from the disease. In order to combat this dual impact upon the city's most vulnerable residents, 
the administration has proposed state legislation to permit a community hiring program, which would allow the city to require city contractors to hire locally from high poverty communities. We look forward to hearing the results of that proposal at today's hearing and on other initiatives that will be heard of. The Office of Workforce Development has also updated its work with the five industry partnerships contained in the Career Pathways Plan. They are healthcare, technology, construction, food and beverage, and industrial and manufacturing industries. Each of these partnerships working groups have developed their own plans to combat unemployment during this pandemic. And we would like to discuss those today as well. Additionally, the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity developed a data portal in coordination with the Office of Workforce Development to serve as a workforce hub for city employment resources and programs. As we understand it, this data portal went live in August, but the agencies are still working out the kinks. We'd like to hear more about that today as well, and hopefully that there aren't any more kinks since portals are what we are all using, just like today's virtual hearing. Finally, the Economic Development Corporation and the Department of Small Business Services have rolled out their own initiatives, both standalone and in coordination with each other or with the Office of Workforce Development to try to bring our jobs back to this city. This is our number one goal that we must accomplish. Uh, I will uh, let my co-chair, Mark Joni, discuss the SBS initiative, initiatives, uh, but as we understand it, EDC has also launched several programs since the pandemic, including launching a $7.8 million cybersecurity boot camp, awarding almost a million dollars in micro grants to support workforce training programs, expanding entrepreneurship programs in Queens, offering salary negotiation workshops specifically for women, awarding manufacturing grants to local businesses in the fashion industry, and as we heard in previous sentencing, uh, uh, hearings, especially right after the pandemic, on how EDC stepped up to help provide the necessary PPE and the grants for local manufacturing for everyone that kept our first-line troops uh, safe and sound. We on the committee look forward to hearing the details and progress of these initiatives and whatever, whatever else EDC has outlined for us today. Committees today hope to hear from the administration about the progress that has been made in adapting the Career Pathways Framework to help the city's economy emerge from this crippling pandemic, as to well, if anything, the council can do in its legislative capacity to assist in those efforts, because whatever it will be, we will get it done. Before I turn it over to my co-chair, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the staff on the Economic Development C Committee, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, our Senior Policy Analyst Emily Fordion, and Principal final, final Financial Analyst Aliyah Ali for all of their hard work uh, in putting this hearing together. They're truly part of our family here. With that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to my co-chair, uh, my distinguished friend and ally in all things. Uh, we are privileged to be joined with small business and the council members on both of these committees. Council Member Mark Joni for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Good morning to all. I am Council Member Mark Joan. I chair of the Committee on Small Business. I'd like to welcome you to our joint oversight hearing today on the city's workforce development programs to combat unemployment. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague, friend, and neighbor, Chair Vallone, for co-chairing this hearing with me today. Small business and economic development go together. They work together. COVID-19 pandemic and resulting shutdowns across the country have impacted all aspects of our lives. As the chair of the Committee on Small Business, I focused my hearing over the past few months on the plight of small business owners who have tragically closed in masses because they can no longer pay their bills. This is through no fault of their own or because of failed business models, but mostly because of COVID and because of consumer behavior changes, and e-commerce. The purpose of our hearing today is to focus on the other essential aspects of our economy, the workers, and this administration's plan to get New York back to work. Since the start of the pandemic, over 65 million Americans have filed for unemployment. When compared with 82 other metropolitan areas, New York City endured one of the worst rates of job loss this past July in comparison to July of 2019. This past October, the city's unemployment rate was higher than that of the rest of the state and the nation as a whole. Even within the city, there are drastic disparities in unemployment rates across certain communities. During the peak of the pandemic, 
Black New Yorkers were experiencing an unemployment rate that was nearly 10% higher than that of white New Yorkers. As of October 2020, the unemployment rates for Black, Asian, and Latino New Yorkers were all above 13%, while unemployment rates for white New Yorkers was around 10. There have been disparities in unemployment across the five boroughs. During the pandemic's peak, unemployment in the Bronx was at 25%, while unemployment in Manhattan was at 16%. My borough of the Bronx has experienced extreme economic devastation. In part, we have the largest percentage of workers in face-to-face -face industries, such as tourism and food service, that were shut down during the most severe moments of the pandemic and have yet to rebound. The Bronx also has the lowest percentage of employees that can work remotely. The unemployment rates as of October 2020 by borough are Bronx at 17.5%, Brooklyn at 13.3, Queens at 13.1, Staten Island at 10.8, and Manhattan at 10.3. With mass unemployment and devastation plaguing the city and hitting the borough of the Bronx hardest, our residents are struggling just to survive. I'll also point out that the death rate for the Bronx residents was double that of the rest of the city. 20% of Bronx residents applied for SNAP benefits in October, compared to 13% citywide. 10% of Bronx residents visited a food pantry or soup kitchen in October. And 15% say that having enough food to eat is their main concern. And finally, 63% of Bronx residents are on Medicaid compared with 45% in Brooklyn and Queens, 33% in Staten Island, and less than 30% in Manhattan. These statistics are tragic. They are the result of failures at the federal, state, and city levels. While we participate in the Zoom hearing, there are parents in this city that are foregoing breakfast so that their children can eat for our on food lines for hours waiting to get a food box to take home to feed their family. I was glad to see this past August when SBS Commissioner Janelle Doris announced the creation of Career Discovery NYC, a centralized online resource to help New Yorkers with career discovery and training. I appreciate the commissioner and thank him for his tireless work over the past months. Nonetheless, I wonder how New Yorkers without internet and access these resources or any workforce development-based initiative from other agencies. I look forward to hearing from the administration's testimony today on how they plan to get New Yorkers back to work and help ensure all communities can achieve a higher level of economic security. As I've outlined that COVID pandemic has caused intense disparities unemployment rates across the city, an equity-based approach to workforce development is obviously necessary. And I look forward to hearing how the administration's initiative to combat unemployment have been targeted to New Yorkers in most need. There is strong evidence that highlights the correlation between high COVID-19 rates, health, death rates, poverty, and employment. That said, I want to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, legislative aide, Austin Sacker, our senior legislative counsel, Christopher Sartori, our policy analyst, Noah Meitzler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for all their hard work preparing for this hearing. I'd like to turn it back to my dear friend, Chair Vallone. Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Joe and I. We have also been joined by Council Members Menchaca, Rodriguez, Powers, and Ku. So we have almost 10 Council Members and about almost 40 people who have signed up or groups to speak. So today's hearing will have time limits because there's no way to get to everyone. Uh, as our Council Members know, Council Member Joe and I, and I will do the first round uh, of some questions, but we will quickly turn it over 
uh, to our council members, and then we will go back to the three um, agencies that are here. I'd like to now turn it over to our moderator and our committee council and my dear friend and new dad, who has not had a lot of sleep, but he is looking good, Alex Polinoff, to go over some of these procedural items that we were just talking about. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as the Chair mentioned, I am Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Economic Development Committee for the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you were called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the administration's testimony. I will be calling upon panelists to testify individually, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, Janelle Doris. The following members of the administration will also be available for questioning. First Deputy Commissioner of Small Business Services, Jackie Mallon. Senior Vice President of Partnerships at the Economic Development Corporation, Justin Creamer, and from the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, Director Amy Peterson and Deputy Director Chris Neal. I will call on you shortly for the oath, and then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for that written testimony is 72 hours after this hearing. The committee chairs have also asked me today to note for the public that we have a large number of witnesses scheduled to testify and we expect this to be a long hearing. So we will be reviewing written testimony, which is also part of the record in case you need to leave before you are called upon to testify. Before we begin our testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or who will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Doris. I do. First Deputy Commissioner Mallon. I do. Senior Vice President Creamer. I do. Director Peterson. I do. Deputy Director Neal. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Doris, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Jonai, Chair Ballone, and members of the Committee on Small Business and the Committee on Economic Development. As mentioned, my name is John L. Doris. I am the Commissioner of New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon, Amy Peterson, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, Deputy Director Chris Neal, and Justin Kramer, Senior Vice President of EDC. I am grateful for the opportunity to testify on our workforce centers and the evolving impacts of COVID-19 on the city's workforce. As the nation faces an uncertain economic future, New York City job seekers are facing unprecedented challenges. Our goal is to continue to reach New Yorkers across the city, connect them to the resources they need to persevere through this crisis and emerge stronger. Through our network of 18 Workforce One centers, SBS connects job seekers to employment opportunities, industry-informed trainings, and a variety of candidate development services, such as resume development, interview preparation, and job search workshops. Annually, we serve over 100,000 New Yorkers and connect more than 25,000 New Yorkers to employment and nearly 3,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. Through our industry partnerships, SBS has worked collaboratively with industry to design training models that prepare local talent for careers in food service, industrial, construction, health, and tech sectors. Despite the 
uncontrollable impact of COVID-19 on our city, SBS was able to quickly shift all 18 Workforce One career centers to a virtual service delivery model. As a result, our Workforce One centers were fully operational by March 23rd. This allowed us to provide critical support to nursing homes, community hospitals, and other essential service providers in filling their urgent staff needs at the height of the pandemic. Our Workforce One Career Center staff continue to be focused on identifying job opportunities. Since the onset of the pandemic, we have assisted more than 63,000 individuals, referred over 32,000 people to jobs, worked with over 900 businesses on over 19,000 job opportunities. To date, we have connected more than 7,500 New Yorkers to jobs with an average wage of $17.36. New York City industries have been devastated by the pandemic. Job losses have been extensive, and SBS is here to help job seekers connect to new jobs and adapt in the face of this crisis to upgrade their skills and help them pivot to new careers. As a response to the increased demand for home health aids during the COVID crisis, we launched the Home Health Aid Training Program to support the city's long-term care sector during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. We, we introduced Career Discovery NYC, a centralized resource to help New Yorkers with career discovery and training. From mid-March through the end of October, 1,053 participants enrolled in our training programs to prepare for careers in tech, industrial, and healthcare. New York City recovered 312,000 jobs from May to October, and our employment rate dropped 7.1 percentage points since June. Both the private and government sectors continue to slowly see an increase. SBS is dedicated to our core outreach collaborating with a network of 300 community-based organizations throughout the five boroughs to source candidates and address barriers faced by job seekers. Through our Workforce One system, SBS works on addressing specific communities' critical needs by providing and tailoring services to veterans, out-of-work youth, foreign-born New Yorkers, and New Yorkers formerly involved with the justice system. SBS is committed to doing everything we can to support New Yorkers through this pandemic. We look forward to our continued collaboration with the City Council on this effort. And thank you for providing me with the opportunity to update you on SBS Workforce Services. I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll now turn to questions from the Chair. Uh, Chair Vallone, you may begin your questions. Always dangerous when you have me on the unmute ability for myself. <laughs> As my wife will testify, that is not a good idea. Um, so thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to this. If you just look at the esteemed crew of staff and workers that are on this virtual panel, uh, we couldn't be in a better set of hands to deal with today's topic and this crisis. Um, so much of what the Commissioner spoke about and what we've talked about in the past is almost now we're living with a giant asterisk, right, everyone? I mean, the plans that we had pre-March of 2019 and the plans we have now are, are, are in strike, striking contrast with each other. So what we have been doing through our committee and working in partnership with James Patchett and EDC is going step-by-step step each month how the crisis has trans transformed the city to crisis management mode and how we've been dealing with that management mode to get through the crisis and then bring us to 2021 to hopefully see the light within spring to get us back. So today's hearing is another extension of that. And just with a little history too for everyone, um, this always used to be a joint hearing. And it was an, always a great, it was the best hearing of the year because there is this synchronicity between EDC and small business and the mayor's team on all things. But because that hearing has really became such a massive, massive hearing. And, and lots of the details got lost in the, the, the general size of the topics. We've split that up now. And now we have our, our great chair, Councilmember Mark Joni handling 
that topic and their committee and then within our committee at EDC in our world. So for those who are wondering, that's how this topic has been handled in the past. Today, we are rejoining that vision once again um, to hear on some updates with, with how the two have been working together, I guess pre and now in the pandemic and with 2021 coming up. So with that, um, just for a little general background, if I could ask EDC to just give a little bit of that history on the relationship EDC has with small business. And uh, so we could start with that premise and then going forward. Uh, thank you, Council Member. And just a quick clarification question. When you're saying small business, I assume you mean small business services? Yeah, yes. You know, between great. the acronyms and the uh, <laughs> shortened amount of time, that's what we're talking about. Just want to make sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you uh, again for the question, for having us here today. Um, I'd say taking a step back, um, you know, EDC sees ourselves as an important um, player in the overall city's economic development, or excuse me, workforce development equation. Uh, we see economic development as a, um, and, and, and workforce development as two sides to the same coin. Um, we, the, through the work that we do, as you know, uh, our, our, our really our goal is to create sectors um, that will create the middle class jobs uh, now and going into the future. Um, but we can't be creating these jobs or these industries about ensuring that these jobs are accessible for New Yorkers. Uh, we also sit at an interesting position because through the work that we do, we're often at the intersection of discussions between industry, uh, academia, and also, um, of course, government. Uh, so we can bring a lot of uh, uh, resources and, and insights to the table. So we are in uh, regular contact with our colleagues at both SPS, but also um, with Amy's team at the Mayor's Office for Workforce Development. Um, there are monthly meetings that take place where, um, uh, uh, where we discuss um, the latest um, activities that each agency is, is working on, uh, find ways to, to, to collaborate and, and coordinate. Uh, in addition to that, specifically um, with SBS, there are weekly uh, check-in meetings uh, between staff and at, at, the, at the commissioner level uh, to ensure there's alignment. Um, we also meet on a monthly basis with Amy's team to ensure that there's a one-on-one -on -one dialogue that's, that's taking place and we're in lockstep with the rest of the administration. Um, and then, uh, so that's a bit high level, but when it comes down to brass tacks and specifically of projects, um, we make sure that we try to find ways to work with SBS and, and other agencies in our projects. So some examples um, that I'm sure we're aware of is our Brooklyn Army Terminal uh, has a, a Workforce One Center that's based within it. Um, the work that we do for Hire NYC, uh, we work very closely with SBS uh, to source candidates. We also work with BYCD uh, to source candidates as well, along with other uh, community-based organizations outside of the city family. Um, we work with SBS on uh, our Women.NYC initiative, uh, as there's clear alignments there with, uh, uh, with the We NYC uh, program. So Justin, that, that pretty much covers what most of our past topics and committee hearings have been. So for those, again, I always like to keep teach or use each hearing independent for a lot of new folks that are listening in and then as a continuation of the past. But how, how is EDC's role in, I guess let's go specifically with workforce development with SBS. So is there a coordination and use of resources, distribution of resources? How is that partnership directly with SBS and EDC in dealing with workforce redevelopment resources? Yeah, so as you mentioned before, um, you know, with your introductory remarks, um, you know, COVID is an is a ongoing, evolving um, uh, situation. And so um, you know, early on, um, you know, we worked with SBS to, to uh, develop uh, supply chains locally for, for PPE. Uh, and we work with SBS to identify talent to, uh, with some of those, uh, those initiatives. Um, as we are moving forward um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, looking to you know, post-pandemic uh, post future, you know, we continue to invest in sectors that we think are gonna grow like tech and life sciences. 
uh, as examples uh, of, of two sectors. Um, we work with, with SPS to make sure that the investments we're making in tech are, are tied to SPS's programs like Tech Talent Pipeline as, as one example. Uh, another example would be, I think more directly answer your question, um, as we think about things, what is, what does, how does the city leverage a lot of the hard earned um, lessons learned from the pandemic and make the city a hub for, for public health? Um, that will both be a job creator, but will also uh, make sure the city is safer for future pandemics and health emergencies. Um, we were, we're going to be organizing um, uh, you know, sessions to further develop the, the topic, and, and those outreach lists are co-created with, with SBS um, and, and, done, and done jointly. You and, mentioned and in jointly. working with those programs that you would invest or finance in. Can you expand how, what is the level of that commitment? How has that changed, I guess, pre and post pandemic? So how is EDC funding these type of initiatives with SBS and has that changed? And how are those priorities determined? Yeah, so um, in terms of funding, um, uh, it's, it's of course a fluid situation with um, you know, the, the budget deficits that the city is facing. Um, I don't have any specific numbers to, to share with you at this point. Um, I can get back to you um, with that information. Yeah, I think that's critical because it also highlights for everyone how the crisis is such a challenging force for all of these. You know, we had a focus on how we we're going to deal with this in pre-March, and it was then these programs that we're talking about had a definitive outcome. Now that's all changed. So yeah, we would, we would like to get an update on that. I, I, here's this, I guess not a simple one, but here's an, an example of a direct amount of money. So the New York City Neighborhood Capital Corporation was a recently awarded 50 million from the federal new markets tax credit program. These tax credits will go to providing low cost financing to develop projects in low income New York City communities, including development of schools, healthcare centers, grocery stores, and community. Um, could you give us some details on that Oh, those awards, you know, how, how is that being handled and who will get and what projects will get prioritized first from a grant like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, you shared some of the background, um, but uh, as you just mentioned, uh, this is a federal program and EDC has been awarded funding uh, through the past four years uh, to the tune of about $160 million. Um, uh, we are required uh, through the program to uh, uh, use the resources that come with it to uh, invest in projects that provide social services to low-income communities. Uh, there's four areas that we look at um, when making these investments, broadly speaking. Um, first is community facilities. Second is healthcare clinics. Third is supermarkets. Fourth is industrial centers. Um, while none of these explicitly are, are workforce development programs per se, they all are required um, to participate in higher NYC, which of course, as I mentioned before, we work with SBS on to source uh, candidates. Um, the, uh, to give one example where a recent investment does have a workforce development um, overlay is a Madison Square Boys and Girls Club in Harlem. Um, that's a, a project um, that has about 50,000 square feet located within it. Um, and you know, pre-COVID times, about 450 youths go through the door on, on a daily basis. There are workforce uh, or, or, or academic training programs and, and college prep courses that are offered within there. Um, we do have a RFEI that is currently out right now um, where we are looking for uh, healthcare providers across the five boroughs who have uh, projects in mind um, that would be eligible for uh, the new market tax uh, credits program. So we would certainly welcome the council support in getting the word out on that project um, so we can get um, you know, the best uh, applicants possible um, and, and hopefully be able to fund uh, uh, ones that come in. Well, you mentioned the four or five factors that determine this. Is yep. that borough by borough? Is that even distribution? How is, how is that allocation? I mean, because when council member Joe and I highlighted the unemployment numbers, they're staggering, right? And, and when you see, yes, it's changed a little since June, but I am not, uh, everyone knows my stance with keeping small businesses open and restaurants and everyone as best we can, especially this month. If we, yes. if we continue to hear the threats from the state above us on closing anything during this 
month when there's only two to three weeks left during the holiday season for all these businesses to recuperate anything they can is insanity. January is a different story, but we have to do what we can to keep everyone alive. How, how is that look at on a five borough basis? And is there any difference in the allocation of the awards for each borough? Yeah. Um, uh, well, first off, I, I, we can follow up with you to, to, to how those allocations have been done in the past um, from a, a borough dis distribution perspective. But broadly speaking, um, you know, we do have a, a five borough strategy. Um, and so we do always have an eye out for equity. Um, all projects um, that come in, we, we, we evaluate those on a case by case basis to make sure that they align with our, our, our values. Um, you know, if a project um, is based in, in one borough, um, you know, our, our hopes is that uh, a project, uh, excuse me, the project itself um, would be something that would be accessible to residents uh, in other boroughs as, as well. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back, Justin, there's, there's other council members that have joined in. We're now joined by council members Powers, Cornegy, Lander, and Levin. So we have quite a few. Uh, and there's three separate groups basically on this first panel for everyone who's watching. So just before I turn over to council member Joe and I, uh, my co-chair for small SBS, uh, for the mayor's team, just can we quickly take a peek at and talk about um, the work you're doing with the Economic Opportunity Program and the citywide data platform that you recently created. Um, right, Porter went back, I think, to December 2019. And I, I like that you have, I guess, the first five city agencies report data. If you can give us an update on the working.nyc.gov um, program and how the portal has been launched and where we see how we can get additional information from the remaining agencies, that would be great. Yeah, hi, this is Amy Peterson. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today to talk about this incredibly important issue. Um, for us, uh, we are um, really focused on the things that systematically will improve uh, opportunities for workers and kind of connect the, the vast system that we have. And you raised one of them um, and what you were talking about. Um, so. For, for a long time, um, uh, we all know that there's multiple workforce programs across a lot of different agencies. And it's really critical that um, we, they talk to each other and that we can share data about a worker's progress or a New Yorker's progress through the multiple systems, right? Someone who goes through the summer youth employment program might then take advantage of an SBS program and might also be participating in, in an HRA program. So the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity has been working uh, with our office and all of the city agencies to create an integrated workforce data platform that uh, collects what are called common metrics. So uh, similar data at an individual basis um, across all of the workforce programs um, and then um, brings that into a system and is able to look at that data um, and also, if we, if we have the right data and we um, have an opportunity, we can actually compare that to the state DOL wage reporting data, which gives you all information, well, uh, information about jobs that people have and wages and things like that. It's not, it's not the cleanest system, but you get that information. So um, they have uh, integrated about 50% of the, the programs and most of the really big ones. Um, uh, SBS, DYCD, um, and a few others. And um, it's pretty uh, interesting um, to be able to see how it, how it maps. The idea is that this will be made available um, to the public um, um, in 2021. I think that, that got delayed a bit because of, of COVID. Um, and we're looking forward to be able to do that. And we also um, intend to start reporting our data that way, which will ensure that other programs that um, aren't yet in um, get in. And um, I think everyone will see a real benefit also on uh, information that I know is important to you about where these people live um, and how people across different neighborhoods are accessing services. So, Amy, you did the right thing. Oops, sorry. That doesn't sound right. Um, well, in bringing us back, I appreciate that to the beginning point. So you said they and are, they are putting in the information or you have about 50% of the data. Can we just clarify 
where, what data do you have today through this new system, the collection of the interpooling of the different workforce plans and what is still missing that we can get to you or assist you with? Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, the last major bit of data aside from a lot of smaller agencies that's uh, currently being uploaded is the HRA data, uh, which will be really helpful in coordinating this. Um, and we can give you, uh, we can actually share with you a list of the programs um, that are already included and the number of people through those programs. So is that the portal we're talking about is something that's internal now and is not yet a public portal? It's internal now, um, but the intent is to make it uh, available publicly. And the, the, the team has really been working on making sure it's something that works for the workforce programs themselves and for the people um, like us, us and you who are interested in the kind of bigger picture. I think it would be <laughs> instrumental in helping right now in the crisis, even if it's a pilot portal or of some type, just to get, um, um, I don't think anyone would be upset, even if it's not completely 100% of the data at this point, just to get some, there's so much interagency coordination on this topic. And it, it really needs to get to you as soon as possible so we can distribute it because each one of the council members can, and their committees can have the same exact topic as a committee hearing and delve into their uh, committee on each on what the workforce development plan is in their committee. So it's such a broad topic um, that we're totally really relying on, on you to get this type of portal going. Is it with beyond the portal, how would how has your resources changed? since the pandemic or what your focus is now on trying to get us back to the recovery through this workforce development? Um, yeah, through our office, uh, separate from the portal, um, you know, I think, uh, and I, I wasn't here in 2014 on the workforce development world and wasn't uh, directly involved in kind of drafting the career pathways report, but I think it really provides a good structure for how we should be focused on workforce development then, but clearly now in what's really important. And so we've been really trying to um, advance and highlight a number of the things that um, will make our system work better um, as we rebuild our economy. Um, and I think the, the, the key things that we wanna focus on are, are, are the jobs and making sure they're good jobs and good paying jobs. And that's something that is, is incredibly important. Um, so, on, oh, uh, right. yeah. can, can you like just on the good paying jobs and equitable distribution, is there a direct plan that you can say that you work with SBS and or the EDC on that specific topic on how the coordination is between these since the three of you here today? Yeah, so that's, um, so I, I, I think it's important to talk uh, first, about the project labor agreement that the city negotiated with the building trades um, and was announced in August. And I was just on a, another uh, workforce call hearing about, you know, our hopes, right, overall nationally for infrastructure and the ability to create lots of jobs through infrastructure. Um, and the, the decades old question of how do you make sure that those jobs go to people in the communities that we are focusing yeah. on. And so uh, in partnership with SBS um, and with the building trades um, and with EDC, who's doing a number of projects, um, we've negotiated a project labor agreement with the building trades that has workforce components that have um, are, are new and have not existed in a citywide project labor agreement to this date to this date and are incredibly important from someone who's spent a lot of time working with programs trying to get people into the building trades myself. It's just amazing to see the cities and the building trades commitment. So there's two components to that. One is how you get people from the communities into the trades. And the building trades partnered with uh, my office in housing recovery, but more importantly with Workforce One, SBS, um, doing the build it back uh, project labor agreement and really trying to get people involved in the Sandy recovery and uh, really felt like that was a good match for um, connecting the pre-apprenticeship programs that have direct relationships with the unions and can get people into the unions with people on the ground in the communities. And so um, as part of the new project labor agreement, there's a new initiative, Higher NYC Construction Careers, which is really focused on ensuring that people 
um, from communities and the Workforce One and SBS does that with their community partners, right? So they um, are on the ground with community partners talking to them about recruitment. And I really wanna grow that more and more and more, right? The, the more that we can be working with the people who are organizing on the ground in connection with New Yorkers to get them into this Workforce One process, then they get connected to uh, pre-apprenticeship programs. And we launched Higher NYC Construction Careers in November and have uh, three training classes um, that we recruited for that are uh, two that are going on right now. One, I think, hasn't quite started yet. Um, and are really focused on ensuring that people get into the trades. But the not that that's not incredibly exciting, but the, the new part of the, <laughs> the new part of the project labor agreement is there is now a commitment within the project labor agreement for two things. One is that, and this was with the building trades in partnership, that 30% of trades hours will go to residents of zip codes with a poverty uh, level over 15% or NYCHA housing. There's about 50,000 NYCHA uh, people in NYCHA developments outside of those zip codes. Now these are kind of pre-COVID, so we, we should at least clearly have that conversation, but 15% poverty. Um, and that 30% of the 30%, so 9% will go to apprentices. So this is the first time that the city's actually requiring apprentices on city projects, um, which will ensure that those entry level jobs that are the opportunities that we just said we're gonna feed through the Workforce One system, come in. And we've been talking, just bringing it back to EDC, we've been talking a lot to EDC about how that same model works with uh, conversations they're having about uh, with their partners in Justin Construct to this, this more than I can, um, where they might be, you know, encouraging uh, climate uh, groups to come to New York City or businesses and things and try to figure out how that, how that works. So, so that's in place. And what that does is if we award a lot of projects from uh, infrastructure funding, right? Fingers, you know, we get some money, stimulus money, um, and those are subject to the project labor agreement. Um, we'll have this commitment, and the, as we, you know, work hard, I think to get more funding for training programs is also part of stimulus funding. Um, we really want to invest more and more in, in those pre-apprenticeship trainings and the workforce one system to make sure we can make that connection. Well, that, that is exactly what we want to hear. Those are, those are the perfect examples of how we can get through this by highlighting our apprentice programs, working with our trades with the POA agreement. So thank you for that. Uh, and I'm sure our council members will come back, Amy, to you on that. But I'd like to turn over to my co-chair, council member Mark Jonai for Small Business for his questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Vallone. And I must say, having the SBS, EDC, and uh, workforce alongside of economic development and small business is the approach to this tremendous uh, hurdle that we have ahead of us. I know that we're all striving to have our unemployment numbers back to what they were pre-COVID. But I can't help but mention, and you heard me allude to it in my opening comments, the correlation between COVID-19 rates, health, death, poverty, and unemployment are uh, the evidence that's there speaks for itself. In addition, the unemployment in the cities caused by the pandemic has not equally impacted all of the five boroughs the same. Uh, the Bronx has the highest levels of unemployment in the cities, I noted, um, is almost 18%, which is uh, four to seven percent higher than the other four boroughs in the city, but it's also had a uh, high level of impact on residents of color and foreign born city residents that are disproportionately impacted by unemployment. And I'm going to ask the question to each of you can you outline an equity based approach to combating unemployment? Maybe with you, Commissioner, first, uh, Danelle, and then we can go on to uh, economic development and workforce. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for that uh, question. Um, as you know, you know at, at SBS, our work is based and 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 targeted on equity and making sure that everyone uh, who needs an opportunity, who needs to be at a job, be it start a business um, or community, it needs a corridor. 
uh, that needs to uh, get representation um, with us. We are there working with them. Uh, for us, uh, you know, we've been, we continue to have our, um, our Workforce One centers uh, across uh, the city that specifically targets and speak to those uh, communities that are that are hurting the most. Um, you know, it's over seventy percent. As you come into our Workforce One centers, are, are people of uh, identifies people of color. Uh, certainly, uh, those who uh, eighty percent or so without an associate degree or uh, of the sort. So we are targeting the the right audience. Uh, we are going after with our uh, three hundred community partners uh, the uh, the uh, targeted groups that we think that need, of course, the resources the most. And then on, on top of that, uh, at the end of it all, when we do provide the service, uh, we're seeing uh, that we are averaging over uh, a minimum wage for uh, all the jobs uh, that we do connect uh, New Yorkers to. So there is a five borough strategy in the sense that we have 18 workforce centers um, all over the city. We have uh, specific targeted training for those who need it the most, those who are literally our clients who come in to our Workforce One centers, now virtually, as we've been doing, um, and those resources that they need, be it uh, connect to them to career um, advancement opportunities, such as how do they move up, so need different trainings for that, or uh, resume uh, preparation, interview skills preparation, just sort of the basic uh, things, nuts and bolts that they need. That's what we do. We are there to provide those services with our 18 Workforce One centers, and then again, uh, targeted on an equity basis, making sure that the people uh, who actually need this support, uh, they get it. Um, and that's what we've been doing uh, at our 18 Workforce One centers across the city. Thank you for that answer, uh, Commissioner. And you know that I appreciate you and what you're doing and the tremendous job and how you've met these challenges. And we're working together closely. But with that being said, Commissioner, Workforce One is currently closed and it's being done virtually. What are we doing for those that don't have access to the internet? The most neediest, remember? And in particular, the borough of the Bronx, the poorest, those that have been impacted the hardest. So we have 18 workforce centers. How many are located in the Bronx? How many employees do you have at these work centers? And how many are each work center? So if we're gonna talk about equity, let's talk about equity. What good is a workforce center that my that Bronx sites or city residents can't access because of the lack of technology and access to the internet? Yeah, so thank you. We have four uh, centers in the Bronx. Um, we have also uh, provided uh, you know significant resources um, in the Bronx. Um, 15,000 uh, residents we've served, over 15,300 residents we've served in the Bronx specifically uh, since the pandemic ensued. Um, we also, uh, you know, understand the, the digital divide and disconnect and we did, you know, survey. We reached out to those we were serving and those uh, through our community partners have also surveyed and understood that, um, you know, 92% of uh, the uh, those we are serving, the residents we're serving there have, um, you know, access uh, to a device to upload a resume. 96% uh, have reliable internet access as we have serviced between 9 and 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And then uh, because we wanted to go further, we wanted to understand, you know, you know how many of them um, can, you know, uh, get an attachment off of an email, etc. So 94% so of them we service had said that. So, you know, we, we have taken uh, much, much care in ensuring that even during this virtual uh, uh, reality that we're in right now, that everything is, is virtual. We did pivot uh, just one week into uh, the closures, um, you know, March, I believe 23rd or so. Uh, we were fully operational and we were helping 63,000 New Yorkers uh, across, uh, uh, you know, across the city. Um, and so I, while I hear the concern around access, uh, we believe through our community partners, 300 of them, uh, our four workforce centers, particularly in the Bronx, as we were speaking of the Bronx, um, we, and our surveys that we've conducted with uh, the customers, 
that we are that we are uh, really reaching uh, those that we need to reach and those who uh, need it, need help the most. Commissioner, thank you again. Uh, the two hundred and fifty thousand, approximately two hundred fifty thousand Bronx sites that are currently unemployed don't even take into consideration the independent contractors and self-employed. So that number is much, much higher. And we don't have the statistics for it. Some of the numbers that I've heard are way over 30% as an estimate. Again, I go back to even the partners that you have that are out there producing surveys. Residents are sheltering in place. The same partners that you are relying on to get the word out are social distancing and not allowed to have large gatherings. The same group that has no access to internet is not being um, invited to me to hear about the services that you have and what you're able to offer them. We're not doing enough short of text messaging emailing, door knocking, regular mail to get the word out. If we know who the unemployed are, and we have those numbers, why aren't we mailing them something? Commissioner? Yes, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure you finished. So we, just, just for the record also, you know, uh, we do serve um, our residents by phone. So if you have a phone, you can you can also call and you can call a number and you are serviced. There is a hotline. Uh, there's a number there uh, for for you to call based on on, on the borrower. So, um, you know, look, we are uh, we have uh, you know significant staff in the Bronx. Um, you know, working with uh, you know the local partners, and it, there's got to be a combination of things is what we're doing, right? There is. There's the virtual workforce one centers. We've surveyed folks. They said, you know, majority of them overwhelmingly can sort of navigate that process. We have phones that they can call. They call the phone, call the number. Somebody can assist you there. Uh, we do have then our partners who some of them are on the ground and out in the community um, and, and continue to work. It is a complex situation, right? We do understand that. Uh, but there's not uh, a Bronxite who would come for service or seek service from SBS and wouldn't get it. Uh, that, that is not the case. And uh, again, because, you know, we have significant number of partners around across the city, 300. I mean, we're not doing this in, in isolation. And, and with our work, workforce centers uh, and with the resources that we've set up, we believe, uh, you know, there's more. Of course, there's always more to be done. We'll continue to do that. Um, folks can also call 311 um, and they can get services uh, directly. And so, look, we understand the challenges of this time. I think, uh, you know, uh, and, and as we've, we've traveled across the city, uh, we've, we know that this is a challenging time and, and, and we want to be flexible as possible. Um, you know, we folks can call, you know, any of our, our, our hotlines. Uh, 311 is the easiest, obviously, because you know, we, they can direct you right through. Um, we've been servicing again, you know, 63,000 New Yorkers, 15 plus thousand in the Bronx. And, uh, you know, we wanna make sure we continue to do that. And, and certainly with your support and others, we, we can continue to reach as many, many residents as we can. Thank you. I was hoping to move on, but now we're stuck on workforce one. Well, if that's the case, then can you explain to me why your numbers are flat uh, from those that are participating through uh, Workforce One from the year 2020 to 2019, where we had a 4% unemployment rate, and we had as high as 25%. Your numbers on those that you're servicing has not increased. It's pretty much flat, if not going down. And if you want, I think you have the numbers if you look at the last five years. I don't know if that's, if you have that in front of you. Um, 2016, Workforce One Career Centers offered services to 104,714. In 17, 104,239. In 18, 102. In 19, 100. In 20, 93. Our employment is five times what it was, and yet we're servicing less. 
Well, I would, a, a few things I'll say on that. Certainly, uh, you know, we have, uh, again, with a constituency and our support of uh, our community partners, we continue to see, obviously, that we are meeting the need that's coming to us. So, I, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, in November alone, we, we've, we saw year over year, I believe it's 20, over 20% 20 activity at our Workforce One Center. So, look, I, I think what you saw in the beginning of this process is uh, the, the, the almost stay at home mandates that we heard the concern about uh, the, the virus. And we, we heard that from folks. We heard about, you know, the concern about jobs and where, where are jobs? Are jobs actually here? That, that was a concern. Um, in, in the marketplace. And then we, of course, in our pivot, as, as, as I mentioned, as we went virtually, we were able uh, to help still, even with the pause in all the, the businesses that had to pause, as you know, and I know uh, with small businesses uh, who are unable to open. And as we began to reopen, we saw some uptick um, in employment um, in various industries as we began to see uh, businesses come back. And so that you see that activity coming uh, from there. Um, we did see, uh, you know, the unemployment rate continue to go down uh, month over month. Uh, last month too, it keeps to go, it keeps going down. We have a 21% increase year over year in November uh, and those were servicing. And so I think that's going to continue, right? I, as, as the economy opens, um, you'll see more activity as we get closer to a vaccine, as we get closer uh, to uh, getting this virus under control, more folks are going to want to engage again uh, in the market. So I think the main thing is, do we have the capacity of the service folks? Yes. Have we been doing the outreach to service them? Yes. Do we have ways for folks to access us that are not using the internet? Yes. And we also, I've seen an uptick again, 21 or so percent uh, from last year to this year. As things open up, I think we're going to continue to see the increase. Thank you, Commissioner. My last question to you is, do you think the administration has done a good job in targeting workforce development resources to the communities that need the most? I believe we are, we are meeting the needs of the communities um, that are there. Again, we have a vast system, the largest in the country. And I want to really put that in perspective. Uh, our Workforce One Center uh, uh, programs, largest in the country, 18 Workforce One Center, every community across the city, 300 partners, uh, can we do more? We're always striving to do more, we're always being creative. We were uh, training programs or other things we're looking to do as my colleagues mentioned before, uh, but certainly um, there's not a New Yorker who call 311 and, and, and won't get help from us. And, and I think uh, that's the first and, and, and foremost, uh, most important thing. If you need help, you can get help uh, and we're there to service them and we're doing that even during this pandemic. So commissioner, don't tell me how much you love me and appreciate me, show me. And that question is then, what are you, I am going to ask a direct question. I'm sure you're going, in the upcoming days and weeks, you are going to show me a tremendous amount of resources that will be coming into the borough of the Bronx compared to the rest of the city. And you're gonna show me the resources that went into communities of color and those that most vulnerable compared to the rest of the city. I'm going to hold you to it because the, the, those vulnerable people deserve it. The borough of the Bronx deserves it. The numbers are there. The facts are there. And now it's about resources. And that has to be tangible. I hope I can rely on you and that in the near future, you'll be able to uh, show me how much you've been able to give struggling communities in particular the borough of the Bronx, which in my case, I'll make the argument for the entire borough should be an economic development opportunity zone. This has been going on for decades. Nothing has changed. We've always had the worst of the worst. We've been at the bottom. We've been at the top of what's bad and at the bottom of what's good. I don't know how much more evidence we need that the borough of the Bronx needs and deserves more resources. Say yes, Commissioner. 
I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're committed sir. to it, sir. You know, in our other work with small businesses, you know what we're doing there with you and uh, our commitment to, to the Bronx. We're going where it's needed the most. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd like to ask the same question about how disproportionately uh, impacted communities of color and borough, and I'll ask that of EDC, NYC EDC first, to see how we're going to assure that your projects are going into these vulnerable communities, into this, into the borough, and I'll use that as the a target group at this moment. Thank you, Council Member, for the question, and, and of course, a, a very um, important topic pre-COVID and um, obviously um, where we are now. Um, I'll start by saying that um, when the pandemic first hit, um, EDC mobilized its resources, um, uh, uh, the networks that we have, um, the, the um, uh, facilities that we have to ensure that the city um, had an adequate amount of PPE that was desperately needed for our frontline workers. Um, this led to lives uh, being protected, but also jobs being created. Um, as, as time has gone on, um, you know, a critical piece of this, of course, as we all know, is, is our ability to keep the economy open. If we can't keep the economy open, then uh, it's harder to keep people employed. So we've recently opened up the Pandemic Response Lab, um, which gives the city a dedicated location to process um, uh, upwards of 30,000 tests in a single day. Uh, this would be a, a critical part for us to keep our, our economy open. Um, bigger picture of thinking about how do we create jobs more widely across all five boroughs, including the Bronx, is you know, we can continue to make investments in sectors that we believe are going to grow, uh, tech being one of them, uh, to, to drill, drill down to that um, slightly. Um, cybersecurity is an area that we uh, have made investments, uh, as we, we talked a little bit earlier about. Um, we have a cybersecurity boot camp that we do in partnership with uh, Full Stack Academy. It's open to residents all across all five boroughs. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the boot camp class uh, only started back in late 2019. We've already had five cohorts have gone through um, roughly uh, about um, 105 students in total. Um, out of that first class, I believe about 90% of the students uh, were able to, to get jobs. So early indicators um, are, are positive for that program. Uh, another sector we're making lots of investments in is, is life sciences. Um, one program that we're particularly uh, proud of is our life sciences internship program. Um, for that, our target is um, uh, local college students um, who uh, come from lower income uh, families. Uh, so this program is running for a few years now. When we look back at, at the numbers, um, yeah, a, a lot of you know, positive things were report there um, through our partnership with the CUNY. So um, roughly 41% of, of all participants in the program have been CUNY students. Um, roughly, actually over two thirds have been uh, non-white. 54% uh, have been uh, TAP or Pell grants eligible students. And 33% uh, of, the, of the participants have been first generation college students. Um, we also work uh, on, on any project that EDC has um, that requires um, uh, you know, a real estate transaction or incentive or, or a new tenant at one of our facilities. They have to go through the Hire NYC program, which we've heard my colleagues talk about the efforts that are being made to ensure that those pipelines that we're connected to to find candidates. Um, come from the communities uh, that are in most need. Um, and, and just to close my, um, my answer to your question here, um, we'll also just mention that the Pandemic Response Institute, which was named, was announced last week, still forthcoming, uh, is meant to uh, long-term ensure that we are better prepared for future health emergencies. Um, and we'll be taking a community-based approach with that on finding identifying what are the infrastructures that communities need to make sure that they are better protected, have better outcomes uh, in the future. Thank you for that answer, Mr. Kramer. Do you have those numbers by borough or by zip codes as to the, the number that you're referring to? Uh, for the programs that I mentioned, um, I don't have them offhand, but um, I can get back to you. Let me talk to the I'd team. I'd love to see them by borough if possible. And if we could really break them down into by zip code, then we really know if we're targeting the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Yep, of course. And I'm going to Absolutely. ask you your commitment that in your projects that you focus on the communities that are hardest hit 
uh, the borough of the Bronx to the most vulnerable in the communities of color. Uh, and you sound like you said 58%, I believe, uh, is the number that you referred to of people of minorities that from community yeah. schools that were participating. Yeah, uh, you're, you're referring to the Life Sciences Internship Program where um, uh, roughly uh, two thirds uh, of participants have, have been uh, non white. Um, and then the 54% was uh, students who are, are TAP or Pell grants eligible. Statistics like that are important. Then we know that the resources are really going into those communities that need it. And anything that you can give me that will help us uh, determine how many more resources you need and that we would laser, laser precision target what you're offering. I'm grateful to you, but I'm going for that commitment that you start focusing on the borough of the Bronx and those communities throughout the city that most need it. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. And Absolutely. I'll ask that same question um, to um, workforce development, uh, Ms. Peterson. Hi, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think I, the two questions, right, was like kind of equity focused and then a, a little bit uh, specifically on the, the neighborhoods that need it most, including the Bronx. So um, the, the three things that I think about most um, in everything that we're trying to do in recovery is figuring out, is there a way, and this is the hardest one, right, to raise the wages of workers who are underpaid for the work that they do. And I think that that's a big piece that we all need to kind of collectively work on uh, together because that would lift up a lot of people in ways that um, we should figure out how to do that with this opportunity we have right now in rebuilding uh, our economy from this. Um, the other is uh, kind of making sure, you know, uh, New York City, both kind of the city agencies, but the larger uh, city itself has such a vast, rich um, workforce um, infrastructure from our adult education programs to our uh, industry-based training programs and all of the community-based organizations and community colleges. It's just incredible. But I think we all know and have all struggled with how do you make it work best and how do you set up those networks and systems that connect people from the communities that you're talking about to the programs and to the jobs. And so um, really focused on uh, uh, connecting that system um, and uh, reaching down into the community, into the um, and I met with an organization from Northwest Bronx uh, last week and they were just talking about the organizing they do and and you know I I haven't thought about as much as as I should uh, just like organizing workers to get into workforce development and so that's I think a big piece of what we want to do and um, maybe that's how we talk about the component of kind of community outreach in in a different way and so that's really important um, but then it's about the jobs right and so how do we connect how do we make the jobs better and how do we connect this system. Uh, to the jobs. And the best way that the city can be a part of that is by the jobs that we create when we spend money. Um, and so I talked about the project labor agreement and how that will help. Um, and just to go more into specifics on the Bronx for that one, you know, when you look at neighborhoods that have poverty over 15%, you look at the Bronx, right? Um, and when you look at um, neighborhoods that have been impacted by COVID, you look at the Bronx and other neighborhoods across the city that we're clearly focused on the communities with the highest level of poverty. But the PLA and the construction projects is just one piece of how the city spends money. And for decades, we've been talking about local hire and community hiring and how do you actually use the money the city spends to create jobs. Um, and so we have uh, worked really hard to think about um, how you get past the legal barriers. And to be clear, the barriers are legal. And for many of us, um, many people who are new to thinking about workforce and jobs and COVID have sent emails or raised the idea of how do you connect people in communities like you're talking about to the jobs that the city creates. And there is no way to um, uh, do it uh, directly with the money the city spends because of state law. General municipal law does not allow us to uh, take into consideration who gets the jobs that we're spending. They care about cost, which we all care about, and they care about integrity, which we all care about. But they are not thinking about who are getting the jobs for the money we spend. So we have legislation 
um, that would look at exactly what you're looking at. We would prioritize for jobs in construction and building services, people who live in zip codes at high levels of poverty, and for all other jobs, we would prioritize people who are themselves in poverty. And I think that the changes we could make in how we spend money on tech and connecting the people who are going through all the great tech programs to those jobs and the money we spend on food and the money we spend on healthcare and the money we spend on building services and all of the things. Um, it's incredibly important. And if we think um, we're gonna get more money um, as part of stimulus to work on climate and healthcare and food and opportunities, we should make sure that we have the workforce system in place, the connection to the New Yorkers on the ground, but also this legislation to allow us to actually spend our money on jobs for New Yorkers. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. I, I'm looking forward to working with you and alongside of you in every capacity and manner to achieve what you just outlined. And we have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm gonna ask the same commitment that we continue to focus on the most neediest of New Yorkers. So thank you. My last question to the commissioner, because that was a warm up to you, commissioner, prepping you for the, uh, uh, the final pitches here. We've learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes over the last eight months on how we dealt with COVID. And obviously there was no history here. There was no track record that we could follow. We learned along the way. Inevitably, we're looking at a second shutdown on the horizon. What are you going to do? What is this administration going to do to prevent a replay of the devastation and the disasters? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I think from a workforce one perspective um, and a workforce uh, general perspective, uh, we, we, we have the infrastructure. And I think this is something that, um, you know, we uh, were able to pivot earlier on in the process to help New Yorkers. But right now we have uh, an understanding of who the clients are. We have an understanding of uh, where we need to uh, focus attention even more so. Um, we also understand better even our partners and their capacity, their understanding them, uh, you know, and what they can, can do or can't do or the resources that they need in addition to what we already have. And so I think that knowledge um, certainly is gonna be critical as we go forward into uh, what may be a potential second wave. Um, and then we also understand, um, you know, again, how outreach works in a you know, environment where you, you can't, you know, you can't uh, be in a room together, right? And so some of our resources, um, the way we train, uh, the way that we communicate, the way that we get the word out, the way that we uh, work with even um, uh, businesses. Over 900 businesses came to us to ask for help to, uh, to uh, source uh, jobs through there. So uh, the, the infrastructure, I think, um, right now is in place, um, which is, I think, the most important thing. We, we, we know what is to what is to expect. We know how to address those concerns, and we have that uh, core infrastructure in place that we can uh, be ready, and we are ready uh, for a potential uh, next wave. Um, again, uh, because we've been through it, and we have those uh, systems in place. Commissioner, thank you. So now we have the knowledge, we have the experience. You just outlined that we have the infrastructure in place. How much in the form of actual resources are you going to put into this before it happens in a, in a proactive approach and not reactive? So the number of unemployment doesn't get 25% again in the borough of the borough. What dollar amounts have you allocated, or has this administration allocated to that support structure that you just outlined ahead of the second wave? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to note, I mean, we're from our budget, and we have a budget that sort of manages uh, uh, the work of the Workforce One Centers, um, it, the budget itself and the four, four, uh, the four particularly if you're talking about the Bronx, those are in the Bronx, 
and the partnership that we've developed on training, et cetera, all these things, uh, we have it, right? It's, it's just, it's just the changing the way that we go about doing the work is what we're talking about, really. I mean, the resources are there. Um, and so, you know, we- You don't need extra funding? Oh, look, we'll take on any additional dollars we can. I mean, certainly we expect and we hope again to get some additional uh, funding from the federal government because that's generally what happens in a down, like downtime. The answer. No, the we, that's what generally happens in a downtime um, where we do get additional dollars. Um, and we're ready to deploy them with additional training, with additional resources for outreach, for additional uh, you know, assistance with interview prep, and also um, you know, going after businesses who may be looking for uh, looking for workers. And so look, I, 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 think, I think what you're getting at, and I think it's important to note that there's a, the largest workforce program in the country we run. Uh, we do have the resources in every borough. Uh, so there's a five borough strategy. And, and we have the allocation of dollars uh, to go ahead and do that. Uh, and if more money comes in, which yes, that is the default right now in the sense the city's facing its budget deficit, uh, as you know, um, you know, we have money that we're working with, but we would gladly take on more from the city, uh, from the state and from the federal government. Um, and as it comes in, we will deploy them accordingly. Thank you, Commissioner. I agree with you that the federal government must do more, should do more. But in the time that that does happen, we hope that it does happen sooner than later, um, and we can't rely on a state. What more is this administration willing to do? Understanding that every dollar that you invest in getting people back to work, every dollar that you invest in small business to make sure that they don't close, that they do reopen, that they do survive, is one that will yield a result. What more can you do? What more can the city do, this administration do, to invest every dollar wisely? And that is about economy and jobs, or jobs and the economy getting people back to work, making sure that they can provide for themselves and their families and helping these businesses survive. This is the emphasis and the default answer, federal government, state government is great. We expect it, we want it, it should be there. But what are you, what is this administration going to do more than they have already? And I can't help but point out that our budget was in June, the budget for um, workforce one was allocated back in June in small business services. We had no idea how much worse this was going to get, how much more this administration has allocated to your agency to, to address the unemployment rates. And secondly, um, why is this administration still doing pet projects like finding $900 million to buy a school bus company? Well, this is not the time to invest in a school bus company, but actually put it into the economy, put it into those small businesses and making sure that New Yorkers can get back to work, that they have a job to return to. You may not have to answer that, but I vented. Let me pass it back to uh, the chair. And I wanna thank you all um, for letting me uh, ask you the questions directly and, uh, and tell them that the passion is not directed toward you. This is what is out there every day on the street, what I hear from struggling families, what I hear small businesses cry to me, that their life's work is in shambles, that come the end of this year, their businesses will not reopen. They're hoping to get through the retail to bring in whatever revenue that they can, because come January and February, they're shutting down permanently. And we failed them. The greatest city in New York, in the country, in the world, the wealthiest city in the world has failed our small businesses. And all New Yorkers, thank you. Chair, let me pass it back to you. I'm gonna pass off to our council, Alex Polinoff, for any other council members for questions uh, and for the committees and the folks that have signed up um, once the council members are done. Um, Council Member Jonah and I will, will wrap up any last questions to the three panels that are here, and then it'll be your turn, <clears throat> and you'll hear your name called in. The Council Member Paul, uh, Council Staff uh, Alex Polinoff will, will lead you through that. So I turn it over to him. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, I'll now call on council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. First, we will hear from Council Member Cornegy. As a reminder, any other members who wish to answer a question, ask a question, excuse me, uh, please raise your hands. Council Member Cornegy, you may begin when the Sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Still muted. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much, Chairs, uh, for having uh, this hearing. It is tremendous to see uh, so many stakeholders on the call at one time uh, on behalf of our small businesses. Uh, I want to start by giving a little bit of a historical context. Pre-COVID, if my numbers serve me correctly, 67% of employment in the city of New York was in small business. 13% was in nonprofits. Um, and uh, the budget, which I am a member of the budget negotiation team to date, has not reflected the need and desire to undergird our small businesses um, in, in the past. I fought every year to make sure that the budget was reflective of real, real, real true support for our small businesses and have been um, mandated through the budget dance process to choose between funding senior centers and supporting small businesses, which is a ridiculous proposition. They are not mutually exclusive. So every time I put forward the idea that the budget should be reflective of true support for small businesses, um, we, we have to vote as members in the budget negotiation committee and prioritize our vote. And certainly no one is going to not vote for having our small businesses. I mean, for not having seniors and youth services and programs that are available. The idea that every year we do this ridiculous budget dance and our, 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 our task at choosing between the two is a tremendous travesty. The budget in the past has reflected um, uh, the support for workforce development, which is which is incredibly important, but really truly no line items that support and undergird by building capacity with access to capital and or technical assistance for our small businesses. So to uh, the SBA, the SBS commissioner, will you support me in demanding that the budget be reflective this year? My last budget, my legacy budget will be reflective of the needs of small businesses and will not be torn apart or, 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 or members from, it, from the administration, their portion of the budget. Because the budget dance generally boils down to uh, you know, the, the budget negotiation and then budget adoption. And so many things happen in between. We have to this year prioritize the budget around supporting small businesses. Workforce development is important, but there's no workforce development without small business. So where are we gonna tell, tell people to go to work if we're not truly supporting our small businesses. And for EDC, um, prior to uh, the pandemic, we were already facing uh, this overage of vacant commercial spaces. We know that because of the pandemic, which has exacerbated uh, the number of businesses that will not return, we're gonna have a super duper overage of vacancy and the vacancy rates are gonna be incredibly high based on us already beginning to move to a platform of uh, online shopping and all those kinds of things. We know the impact that has had on our, our small commercial mom and pop businesses. What is EDC gonna do to ensure that going forward, whether it's doubling up businesses, whether it's doing whatever, our commercial uh, corridors serve two purposes. One is they, are, they, they say that the city is open for business. So those vacancies hurt us tremendously with tourism and with uh, generating revenue. What's, EDC, what's, what's EDC's plan on the commercial vacancy rates uh, kind of reducing them or a plan to, to, to have businesses come together and share the space. What, what, are, what are we going to do from, from that perspective? Because in addition to this online, moving to an online platform of shopping, um, businesses just aren't coming back. Like just because of the pandemic and exacerbating uh, uh, the inability for businesses to survive, what we were already seeing is going to be quadrupled uh, in 2021. Um, so those, those, those are my questions. I hope I asked them under time. Um, and then, and then, lastly, in, in Bed Stuy, we've developed a plan to partner with app-based transportation companies and marry them to brick-and-mortar businesses. And we do a shared economy weekend and now a month-long event where we allow 
for discounted rates into bars, lounges, and restaurants on Fridays, which obviously we can't do now because of COVID, on Saturday to retail outlets, on a Sunday to cultural institutions, and have noticed an, an uptick in business. And it's caused a hire at least of one or two more staff to meet the need and the demand of that partnership between the app-based transportation companies and our brick and mortar businesses. And lastly, there's a statistic that says that if we support and undergird our businesses to the tune that they can hire one more person, every single business in the city of New York, if they can hire one more person, we will reduce the rate of unemployment by 50% in 10 years. Why aren't we doing that? Well, I had seven seconds to remain, remaining, so. Good job, Captain. <laughs> And I think we can do the answer in more than seven seconds for, for Councilmember Corny. As you can see, he was the previous chair, so he's got a lot of the knowledge that we all built up. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Chair. So I'll just say uh, uh, to the, the council member, uh, which it's been certainly uh, a pleasure uh, to work with, uh, both as, as chair and, and, and now as a, as a committee member, um, and and in, out in the communities as well with you to see the devastation that's happening uh, to our small businesses. And so um, I think you certainly have an ally here concerning uh, the need for additional resources um, within the budget process. We certainly uh, will take it. We'll take um, as much as much resources as we possibly can. And you know, some things that uh, we've been doing is uh, connect to the private sector and creating uh, public. Uh, private uh, partnerships uh, around creating uh, loan products, access to capital products, uh, but also uh, helping small businesses from everything from the dealing with the digital divide uh, to the uh, specific challenges of uh, communities of color, uh, particularly black businesses and women uh, uh, businesses in the, in the city. So certainly, look, we, we have a considerable amount of investment there, but certainly looking forward to additional investment uh, so that we can continue to keep the small business community strong, build it uh, further, so that they can hire additional uh, workers. That's the that's the whole point. Uh, you know, uh, for our small businesses, we understand uh, you know 3.4 million uh, uh, employed uh, people in the city before this pandemic were a bit more for small businesses. 65 uh, percent of our small businesses are five persons or less. I mean, we're talking micro businesses that need real. Uh, support um, and we're giving it to them, but the more we get, the more we can do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn it back to the chairs for additional questions. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear from EDC on the um, commercial vacancy rates and, and how we how we intend to address that from an EDC perspective, because part of your portfolio is commercial uh, real, real, real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was just trying to uh, uh, keep the eye on the clock there, but happy to answer the question, uh, Council Member. Uh, so yes, uh, you, you're hitting on a, a very important topic. Um, our, our retail shops um, are, are one of the critical things that bring people to New York City and keep people in New York City in the first place. From a business uh, attraction standpoint, uh, businesses want to be in New York City because their uh, employees want to be able to access all the great retail that the city has to offer. Um, so the you know, things that we've done to date, you know, as, as I discussed earlier today is, uh, ensuring that the city had PPE in place to lower the curve. Um, we can't keep our economy open unless, um, we are able to test people and make sure that we're, we're keeping, um, the numbers down. So we have our pandemic response lab in place. Um, and, uh, you know, we are focusing on, on how do we bring new sectors into the city and, and, um, remind the, the world that New York City is open for business and, and get you know, the corporate tenants back into the office when it's safe to do so, um, because they are ultimately the shoppers of these places that uh, allow them to um, stay in business. Um, you know, this is a topic that we are looking at very closely. Um, we're happy to follow up with you and have more discussions on it, um, but we, we certainly agree this is an important issue. So, so thank you so much. And then you, you mentioned tech. We touched on tech. We know that looking away from tech is a, is, a, is a recipe for disaster, but embracing it and using it in a way that it undergirds our brick and mortar businesses. They are not mutually exclusive. 
Um, I will give you the model that we use here in Bed-Stuy and I hope they use in Brooklyn overall about marrying at least the app-based transportation companies to our brick and mortar businesses. I think it's a replicable model. Um, uh, the chamber in Brooklyn believes it's a re replicable model. And I think it's a model for us to be able to pivot and shift to recovery and resiliency by using both of those uh, uh, platforms to be able to generate revenue for both. That's transportation as well as um, uh, brick and mortars. Yeah, would agree with you there. And, and we do have an initiative out um, uh, that tries to identify challenges that small businesses are, are facing uh, that can be solved by tech. So we'd have, be happy to follow up with, with you on that uh, particular piece. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cornegie, our previous SBS chair. Um, you have given us a lot of the tools that we're using today. So thank you for all your hard work, my friend. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is just, uh, you know, Director Peterson, Amy, you had touched on really just some of the tools that we're working on. And I know that some of the, the portal, I guess, is still not ready for public use and interaction. But in the meantime, you know, I, I, I'm not one to hope for federal stimulus or state legislation, because I know that uh, it's just gonna not be things that we can count on during a city as a pandemic. So with what we can deal with today and what we're facing, how can we use the information that you have for the workforce with this interagency plan that you have, inter interjecting and using the PLA new agreement and getting that plan moving more quickly? How, how can we, what can we expect from, I guess, for your vision to get that plan to move even more quickly and how we can spread that across? And I'm always a big advocate that everything we do, the students are our future. So in working with that model for getting them into the schools, um, especially with colleges as blurry as they are now for folks going to getting to our high school students to letting them know that there's their careers and a path right now in the city in these various um, partners when we went from industry to fashion to from construction to workforce, all of them. How, how can we deal with that without waiting for federal stimulus and waiting for state legislation? Yeah, and, and I think it's uh, it's not waiting, but it's also being ready, right? Like the, 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 the place we don't wanna be in is stimulus funding or state legislation and not being ready to, to, to use it immediately. So I think it's building the systems now so that they can grow as the stimulus comes in and we can make them legally required when the state legislation comes in. So I, I wanna talk about a couple things. So. Um, in addition to the common metrics, which is the system that's gonna kind of track uh, who's going through our system and how they're connecting across different programs. Um, in addition to the uh, system that uh, Commissioner uh, mentioned about career discovery, we've also launched another system. <laughs> um, and it, 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 it's not too many, it's, it's all good. Um, and I think important and a, a good step towards doing exactly what you just said. So. Uh, the city uh, launched a website working.nyc.gov that is actually has a direct relationship with career discovery in that career discovery is taking you through different industries and uh, learning about potential jobs, exploring them, you know, kind of discovering what the, the pieces are and actually getting connected to training um, with that. One of the things that I've heard um, when, when, when I took this job, I imagined I would know every single workforce program that the city has and realize that there are just so many uh, amazing people working on programs across agencies from the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities to veterans to, to DCAS actually, uh, thinking about the green jobs that are coming from the building retrofits uh, to the agencies we all think about, DUICD and um, Scales to Jobs, the, the Mock J program. Um, and SBS and HRA. So the Working NYC uh, database uh, and system is meant to be and is, uh, has been launched, kind of a soft launch because we're really trying to, to make it work for the programs, a place where all of the programs um, that the city has um, exist in one place. Um, and again, we're, we're building it slowly. We've just trained all the other, all the agencies in the city that have workforce programs to, to add their workforce programs to the system. Um, and we've built it with um, the people who try to guide people through the workforce system in mind. So we've spent a lot of time with 
uh, providers and with the agencies that are doing this work to get a sense, and we did this in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, to get a sense of, of how to access um, jobs. Um, so there's a programs piece, which what I would like to see happen in the future is, uh, and quickly, right, is to build that in a way that people who are organizing on the ground to connect people from the hardest hit communities um, can, can understand what opportunities are out there and how to point people to the training that is, is best suited for them. Like what does the worker want to do and best connected to, to jobs like the uh, construction jobs we talked about, just like the tech jobs that were just brought up, uh, like yeah, the healthcare jobs. Sorry, I'm going to let something. But if I could jump in right there for a second. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's the critical piece. And I think what my there's always interagency involvement in everything we do. And from my humble perspective, it's, it's also what hinders us because sometimes we just don't get that cooperation. Yeah. So I'd almost rather see us launch what we can launch, especially during a COVID pandemic, how there are new opportunities because of the pandemic, because there are new job opportunities and what the world and the city is focusing on now in the recovery with the, so many of the jobs that are lost in the traditional model, there's even more confusion for folks on how to transition from unemployment back to employment in these new areas that have been focused. So my request, and I guess with, with everyone else that's part of this is, is let's get something in that world that's tangible and usable now as we grow the portal and the workforce plan, which is as wonderful as it is, but I'm afraid to hold back on a, a larger, more perfect launch as opposed to what, since we are in what we are in now, I'd almost rather say, look, this is what we're working on. This is what we can do. It's a work in progress. It's a pilot launch. It's not the final, but it may even help one person that's unemployed is still better than, than waiting for a perfect plan. Now, that would be my suggestion. Agreed completely. And that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, the, the intent is to, to build the system and to, to really think about how you connect people. Uh, what are the things from organizing on the ground to workforce one to pre-apprenticeship program to apprenticeship program to the union construction job. How is that pathway in tech? How is it in healthcare? And how do we, how do we make that work? And I think the, the tools we have in place um, are, are helping us to do that. And we're just gonna build on them to, to make sure we're ready. Well, there is, is a lot there. We just, I just spoke with council member Joe and I, and I think it's a perfect topic for us to reconvene and relook at early next year. I think this exact meeting, we can look at um, right coming out of the winter months as we look for spring and reopening of, of hopefully everything, um, that we can have this conversation with EDC and with Justin and with Commissioner Janelle and with yourself to kind of bring us to the next phase. And I think that would be my hope. And I wanna thank all of you for that. We have quite a few people have signed up. So uh, Council Member Joe and I, if you have anything for closing before we turn over to the panels, I turn over to you, my brother. Thank you, Paul. Now I don't, I just wanna thank everyone for their time, their input, and obviously the challenges are ahead of us. Um, and I'm a big fan of being more proactive than reactive. The writing is on the wall. We have some history now and knowledge and experience on how to deal with COVID and devastation. We know that the more money we throw at this problem, the lesser the devastation will be. And I, um, although I also refer to my colleagues' comments about, I won't hold my breath waiting for state and federal money be holding upon this city to do more. And the focus must be targeted focuses on communities that need the help most and historically have needed the help most. We have, uh, the facts are there. And I'm looking forward to meeting these challenges uh, with you as a partner. Uh, there's no one agency department that can do this on their own. Thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Due to the number of people signed up to testify today, each panelist will be given only two minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and then give you the go ahead to begin. 
please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panelist to testify today will be Darley Corneal, followed by Jose Ortiz Jr. and then Eric Antocal. Ms. Corneal, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time begin now. Will the muter please unmute Darley Corneal? Thank you. Good morning, committee chair uh, Jonah and Valon, council members and committee staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on how the Consortium for Work Education and our network of workforce development community-based organizations and unions work to ameliorate the increasing numbers of unemployed New Yorkers. CWD actively engaged with the city council and state agency to deliver workforce education and training to underserved New York City communities residents. CWE's Jobs to Build On, JTBO, and Worker Service Centers were launched by the City Council at its own Workforce Development Initiative many years ago. CWE is unique in its structure, demonstrating collaborative relationship between organized labor and community groups on behalf of workers. While such a mutually benefiting relationship is often recommended nationally, it is only exists in New York City. Several months into the ongoing public health crisis, we know that the economic impact of this pandemic will not be short-lived. These rising unemployment levels are impacting communities of color the most, the same communities that have suffered in the highest numbers of COVID-19. We need action at the local, state, and federal level to help working families survive the crisis and re-enter the workforce. As CWE, that means uplifting the integral community organizations and unions that New York City workers know, trust, and depend on. Those groups are uniquely equipped to support our city's unemployed and underemployed, not simply with the workforce development offerings, but with their holistic approach to supporting the individual workers. They understand that it is difficult to find and keep a job if a person's basic needs are not met first. This organization quickly transitioned to those to host this, to host all their classes and services online once we hit pass on March. Through 2020, this group had continued with their education programs, recognized, reorganized their class, and guaranteed that their students receive both educational and social material. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder to council members, if you have any questions or to the chair, please raise your hand. Seeing no questions from the members of the chair, I will call our next panelist. Next is Jose Ortiz Jr followed by Eric Antocal, and then Thomas Greck. Mr. Ortiz, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you to the chairs and the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Jose Ortiz, Jr., and I'm the CEO of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. NYCETC is the voice of New York City's workforce development community, and we work to ensure that every New Yorker has access to the skills, training, and education needed to thrive in the local economy, that every business is able to maintain a highly skilled workforce. Simply put, our over 180 members and partners create jobs and connect underserved New Yorkers in all 51 city council districts to opportunities so they can support their families. The jobs loss we've sustained this year have been indicative of a larger trend. That is automation of businesses at large. According to the World Economic Forum, more than 80% of business executives globally say they're accelerating their plans to digitize processes. For workers and service industries, including retail, hospitality, building maintenance, and transportation, the automation taking place isn't just putting people out of work, it's eradicating or transforming entire careers. Combined with other long-term shifts we've seen across the labor market, we can expect to see a trickle-down effect with permanent ramifications. To combat this, I've highlighted a few recommendations from our July 2020 Recovery for All report. One, we need to provide more resources to workforce development programming. New York City is already home to a multitude of programs that have been studied and tested with proven efficacy in not just skilling workers at scale, but placing them in permanent career trajectory positions with middle-class salaries. We know that thousands of workers will need new skills to re-enter and remain in the workforce, but the human services sector is in danger of budget cuts at all government levels, and they won't be able to do the increased work of aiding the economic recovery without resources. Two, we need to expand broadband access. According to a new survey from the U.S. Census Bureau, there is a clear digital divide. 60% of households making over $75,000 a year can telework permanently, but that drops to 21% of households making less than $75,000.
One reason is the lack of access to reliable internet. In April, the may mayor reported that 1.5 million New Yorkers lack broadband access at home. There's an effort to expand required. Used to divide by 40% over the next 18 months. This is a step in the right direction, but not enough. And three, we need to support small businesses. Our workforce system overwhelmingly serves New Yorkers of color and the unemployment crisis created by COVID-19 follows a similar, similar pattern of disproportionate effects on persons of color. 68% of jobs lost are among persons of color with Latinx workers being bearing particularly high burden, experiencing 30% of jobs lost compared to 26% share from New York City private sector jobs. Looking to the future and the financial investment needed to help the sector thrive, workforce organizations have long partnered with the city and state and federal governments to support New York City residents. In fact, 35% of workforce organizations have more than 50% of their budget coming from the city and state, and many of them only have two to three months of reserve funding to use it and fill in the gaps. Uh, I'm happy to uh, stay here and answer any questions. There's obviously much more to say, uh, so provided the opportunity, I'm happy to share more. Thank you. Jose, let me, let me just jump in, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you. I know you've been waiting. I've seen you on the panel from the minute we started this. So thank you for all the panelists who've been waiting. And when you have recommendations like that, we, we truly do appreciate, especially when they're outlined one, two, three, that, that is how future hearing topics are created, how legislation is created. If anyone sat on my committees, your comments go directly to, um, to legislation, to budget proposals and to ideas. So uh, for anyone, because of the short time constraints that's coming in after Mr. Ortiz, make sure you follow up with an email, with your testimony, with your recommendations and we will get back to you because that is that is how we grow. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Vallone. <clears throat> That's right, Chair. And just for everybody, it's testimony at council.nyc.gov is where you should send that email. Uh, next up, we have Eric Antakal, followed by Thomas Greck, and then Carolyn Iasso. Mr. Antakal, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Before Antakal uh, begins, uh, I just want to respond to uh, Mr. Ortiz. Please email it directly to the council as well, uh, myself and Chair Vallone, um, and you'll have that, I'm sure you have that information available. Will do. Apologies, Chair. Uh, we'll now turn to Mr. Antikoff. Time starts now. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you all for having us. Uh, my name is Eric Antikoff. I'm the AVP of Programs at Non-Traditional Employment for Women or NEW. Uh, we're a nonprofit with a 42 year track, yet, track record, excuse me, of transforming economic prospects for women through careers in the skilled trades. Uh, the effects of COVID-19 have been pervasive on our community uh, and the crisis continues to be disproportionately devastating for women. Uh, in March, 2020, uh, women made up 46% of the workers in the United States and research suggested that women would make up just 43% of job losses as a result of the pandemic. But instead, uh, women, uh, made up 54% of the individuals who lost their jobs. And in September, 2020 alone, four times as many women dropped out of the labor force as compared to men. That's 865,000 women compared with 216,000 men. And of course, black and brown women as always face more dire crises of joblessness. Um, and in the context of this enormous economic need, uh, there is no near term end to the pandemic in sight and there's no clear plans for federal support. So as a city, we have to act quickly to combat the unemployment crisis where we can. And I thank all the other uh, panelists for their comments thus far, um, especially noting workforce development organizations, which are readily available and offer nimble approaches to training over impacted communities and rapidly securing safe, gainful employment. Our programs in particular, like those of so many other workforce development programs, have the ability to connect with employers rapidly, train people for careers that result in uh, jobs with $20 an hour nearly uh, on average, comprehensive benefits and an upward mobility uh, that's, that's second to none. Um, and especially you know, during these chaotic times, uh, we, most organizations, including ourselves, offer uh, social workers uh, who are able to connect directly with clients and make sure they get the support they need. Um, and finally, with the last five seconds, I'll just say that um, not only is it a moral imperative, it's also a uh, economically sound judgment uh, many uh, research sources note that uh, for every $1 invested in workforce development programs, taxpayers gain back 
four dollars in revenue. So uh, not only does it work for New Yorkers to pivot their careers into uh, much That's stronger right. career paths, um, it also works for the city uh, and it's uh, relatively uh, uh, grim bottom line as uh, as these times progress. So thank you all for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Antakal. Seeing no hands raised from the committee members, we'll turn to the next panelist. Uh, next up, we have Thomas Greck, followed by Caroline Yasso, and then Valerie Payne. Mr. Greck, you may begin when the, the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Even though we've waited a long time to do this today, it's worth every moment of our time to try to save our small businesses. And I truly and wholly mean that. Good morning, Chair Vallone and Chair Joni, members of the committee. My name is Tom Gretsch. I'm the president and CEO of the Queens Chamber of Commerce, the oldest and largest business association in Queens County. We currently represent more than 1,300 businesses, the vast majority of which are small businesses with less than 10 employees, with more than 125,000 Queens-based employees. At least we had that many employees before the pandemic. Queens was the epicenter of the epicenter of this pandemic. In addition to the tremendous human toll, COVID has truly devastated our local economy. Like many organizations, we were forced to pivot to meet the new needs of our members. Today, out of duty of our community, we serve non-members as well, all who need our help, regardless of their membership. Throughout the pandemic, we've leveraged strong relationships with organizations in every neighborhood of the borough and further pivoted to provide support to businesses in underserved communities. From working to save New York City's oldest bar, Nears Tavern, with the support of SBS, to participating on the Mayor's Small Business Advisory Council, the Queen's Chamber has partnered with a number of organizations, including SBS, to make every dollar count. We partner with SBS to distribute PPE to businesses so they can keep their employees and customers safe. In fact, we set up our own command center here in Queens, and thanks to SBS's supply, hand out over 1 million face masks. As Queens is the most diverse county in America, we have urgently focused on supporting MWBEs, businesses in black and immigrant communities and other underserved business areas. These businesses are less likely to have received federal funding through the Triple P program or be able to access quality low interest loans. Further, we have partnered with the New York City Employment and Training Coalition to support their work of work their work in workforce development. I'm expired. Okay, Tom, you can finish up. Just wanted to say thanks to a grant from the Peter Peterson Foundation and the New York City Partnership. All five borough-wide chambers of commerce have partnered to launch the New York City Small Business Resource Network. This program will see a newly established team of dedicated specialists embedded within each chamber, working directly with local entrepreneurs in the hardest hit communities. I have much more to say, but that's okay. I understand my time is limited. I just wanted to stress the importance of workforce development as we reskill and retrain tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of humans in our city that desperately need to learn new skills and be retrained. Thank you very much. Thomas, if, if I may, I just wanted to say uh, on a personal note uh, how important it is the work you do at the Chamber of Commerce for Queens. And you mentioned the five borough coalitions. So for everyone that's the listening, especially the commissioners and the three committees, these are the voices that will guide us through this calamity because they are in touch with every small business and every community group. Uh, and I want to say a personal thank you to Thomas Gretsch for our Queens Chamber of Commerce. You've taken it to the highest heights it's ever been. Uh, and we really do listen to you. So I, I just wanted to ask or if, give you a chance to, to summarize because of what we're facing now with COVID, if there was the, the, the top priority that you would think that the Queen small businesses that are, and all small businesses that are on the verge of possibly closing um, that we could do right now with the team that's on with us. What is, what is that ask and what do you think should be that first direction? Thanks for the opportunity. So there's 6,000 restaurants in Queens County. We've estimated since end of April, up to half of them, 3,000 restaurants may never open again and see the light of day. The, if you think about the folks that are in those places that work there, they come here from other countries. If they're Peruvian, they go to work for a Peruvian restaurant. If they're from the coast of Africa, they come work in an African restaurant. They go to where the birds of a feather so-called flock together. You don't need English. You don't need a GED. You need very limited skills to come here 
and boil rice, peel potatoes, or wash dishes. There's an entire infrastructure within our community, not just in Queens, but especially in Queens as the, as the borough with the most diverse population, where those jobs and those opportunities are stricken away and gone. I believe, my, the speaker before me who I don't know, but I want to meet sometime, uses the same words that I say. We as a, we as a city, as an educational system, as a business community, as elected officials, we have a moral imperative to reskill those people. It isn't even job training. And it isn't the thought of taking somebody that might wash dishes in March to be a computer programmer or a coder in six months or a year. It isn't about that. It's about the basic skill set of English as a second language, of getting a GED, of more opportunities. You talk to any restaurateur in the city of New York, in fact, in most places in our country, they started off doing what I said, boiling rice, peeling potatoes, or washing dishes. That's the American dream personified. We need to do everything we can to support folks like New York City, ETC, and Joey Ortiz's group, and others that do workforce development to get these folks back to work, to start paying taxes, paying into the system, using the bus and subway, and getting out there. A rising tide in this case truly, truly will lift all boats. Thank you, Tom. And I just want to add uh, the the mayor the open streets program for the restaurants probably saved our our commercial district, especially on Bell Boulevard, with all the restaurants that are still open. I only had one closure there. Um, so those are quick, immediate relief help steps that we can don't have to wait for the federal, don't have to wait for the state that we can do and get the agencies on board to assist. Uh, stop the city and state fighting with different inspectors that are going and get the businesses to remain open. And, and those are the type of things that we can do. So thank you very much. Uh, May I comment on that? On I, your last comment? Yeah, I'm sorry, Tom. I think we got about 38 more people. So no we will, uh, we'll turn it back over to Alex Fuller. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. All of you. Thank you. I, I, I chair with your, I just want to echo some of the comments that Chair Malone made toward you, Tom. I'm grateful to you for what you're doing. Uh, we need to do more than say the right things. We need to show our small businesses that we're there for them right now. They are the engine of this of New York City's economy. And we need to invest in them at this time of their need to show that they can survive. And we'll thrive later. Now it's about surviving. Thank you for what you're doing and keeping the focus you, on small business, micro business. Thank you, Chairs. Next up, we will hear from Caroline Iasso, followed by Valerie Payne, and then Irene Branch. Ms. Iasso, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Caroline Iasso, and I'm the Director of Community and Government Affairs at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, OBT. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to discuss the impact of COVID on the communities that OBT serves and the ways our organization and sector have responded to the increased and urgent needs. What is clear to organizations like OBT is that training, education, and connections to jobs are lifelines right now, and we need to be doing so much more. Founded in 1983, OBT exists to break the cycle of poverty and inequity through education, job training, and employment. Our programs serve as a bridge to economic opportunity for youth, individuals, and families across New York City, with programming that ranges from high school equivalency to ESOL courses to industry-certified training programs. We meet individuals where they are and work with them to meet their goals. We all know that COVID has taken an incredible toll on our city and has hit young people, immigrant communities, and communities of color especially hard. These are the communities that OBT has served for decades and that were already facing barriers to employment. This crisis has only exacerbated those needs. When COVID hit, we shifted immediately to remote programming and our first priority was to ensure that our students and staff had basic needs met. We fundraised for emergency cash for food, medicine and childcare and doubled down on our holistic approach to programming. We of course navigated the technical challenges, getting students laptops, mobile hotspots, et cetera. And in response to the overwhelming numbers of newly unemployed, we set up weekly resource webinars with the aim of getting people into jobs, we innovated pilot programs focusing on customer service, contact tracing, and coding. There are key issues that we must address as a city. First, universal broadband access is a non-negotiable. We are totally out of step with the necessary infrastructure to support people in accessing these opportunities. Bridge programming has long been a priority for New York City's workforce organizations. And right now it is so critical that we connect every single person to training. 
Digital literacy and basic technological skills are essential for all workers. And this transition has made that extremely clear. So we ask that there be greater investment in digital literacy initiatives, particularly for those communities that continue to be left out due to language access. Hi. And um, I just urge you to prioritize these solutions as you work towards a recovery plan and I'll submit our written testimony. Thank you so much for your partnership and your time and attention. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Ms. Ayoso. Not seeing any other members of the committee with their hands raised, we will move on to the next panelist. Uh, next, we have Valerie Payne, followed by Irene Branch, and then Abe Mendez. Ms. Payne, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, commissioners and council members, members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Valerie Payne. I am executive director of Rebuilding Together NYC, as well as a member of the executive committee of the board of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, led by uh, Jose Ortiz, whose testimony you heard earlier and whose recommendations, of course, I also support. Rebuilding Together is a nonprofit whose mission is to repair homes, revitalize communities, and reskill individuals. We perform critical home repair and accessibility modifications for low income, most often elderly homeowners, employing over a dozen general contractors, small businesses in the process. Uh, we also convene corporate volunteer groups to make repairs and refurbish nonprofit and community centers. And lastly, we operate a workforce development program to prepare unemployed individuals for careers in construction and the skilled trades. This year, as we all know well, the pandemic has had tragic consequences for unemployed and underemployed, as well as low wage workers. The individuals Rebuilding Together serves are from all five boroughs and upwards of 60% are residents of NYCHA housing. They have incomes at or below 70% of the average median income. Over 70% identify as Black or African American, 20% as Latinx. In other words, they are also those hardest hit and most impacted by the pandemic. If the city does not take action to support New Yorkers in short-term hiring and relief actions, as well as long-term training and career development, the racial and economic inequity across the city will be worse in 2025 than it was in 2015. Now is the time to deeply invest in strengthening our communities and economic future by building a system that is data informed as Director Peterson discussed to ensure that services are easy to access and responsive to labor market needs as well as the needs of New Yorkers. Workforce development providers are and will be called on to do more, but aren't able to do so without increased resources and in fact, diminishing resources. I'm expired. Oh, can I have just a couple more seconds? Sure, Mel, you can finish up. Please, sir, thank you. The good news is that the construction industry pivoted to introduce many safety measures and construction in the city is continuing. Um, after a pause, all construction that was permitted to resume in Ju June um, doubled from the month prior and continues to rise in July, according to the Building Congress. Good paying jobs still exist. Uh, so my fingers are crossed for the city and subsequently workforce providers to obtain infrastructure funds and for the city to invest in community-based organizations um, and workforce development organizations across the city that help prepare individuals for not just jobs in uh, construction and the skilled trades, trades, but all of the um, the sectors where there are jobs and there's growth opportunities. Uh, thanks again for your time today and I will submit my full testimony as well. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Next up, we have Irene Branch followed by Abe Mendez and then Sonam Choden. Ms. Branch, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Irene Branch, the Chief Development and Evaluation Officer for the HOPE program. We build sustainable futures through comprehensive training, job placements, advancement, and lifelong career support, uh, much like my colleagues who, who just shared their testimony as well. Um, our focus is on New Yorkers with significant barriers to employment, uh, individuals coming out of the criminal legal system, individuals who have faced homelessness, substance abuse, and other challenges. And our results are strong. In non-pandemic times, uh, on average, we place 75 to 80% of our graduates in jobs and 80% sustain attachment to the workforce for a year or more. As a result of our targeted focus on green jobs, these placements are often in solar installation, energy auditing, landscaping and horticulture, green construction, building support, and more. Um, so not only are we supporting people in getting jobs, but also contributing to the city's sustainability goals. 
Um, while everybody is talking about the heightened importance of workforce development system in this time, uh, I also want to emphasize how the system has come to meet the urgent um, needs of the clients that we serve in the pandemic. Um, you know, our services go far beyond industry recognized credentials, sharper resumes and more compelling interviews. Um, in fact, we've put over $250,000 in cash assistance into the pockets of New Yorkers to address food insecurity, rent and other basic needs. We've provided an additional $250,000 in earned wages for transitional jobs, um, doing work such as census outreach, voter registration and community greeting. So also supporting the city in many ways. Uh, we provided 450 laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots to New Yorkers helping to address the digital divide and we're providing direct mental health support case management and referrals um, which is you know certainly uh, at heightened need this year of course. Our workforce community is essential to the sustainability of our city as we support New Yorkers who are often at the end of the line to secure jobs and support their families. We're also making up the social safety net which we know is being tested. I'm expired. Just a quick thank you uh, to the council members um, on here who have been our supporters and partners um, and, and thanks to everybody. Thanks, Irene. Thank you, Ms. Branch. Next up, we have Abe Mendez followed by Sonam Choden and then Jessica Conway Pierce. Mr. Mendez, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you for hosting this hearing today. My name is Abe Mendez and I'm here representing Perscolis. At Perscolis, we advance economic equity through rigorous training for careers in tech while connecting our graduates to leading businesses in need of talent. Over the past 25 years, we have trained over 8,000 New Yorkers and partnered with over 500 businesses. I wish I could deliver this testimony in person, but I am participating today via Zoom, like the 400 New Yorkers who have enrolled at Perscolis this year. In order to ensure they could access our training, Perscolis mobilized its resources and provided technology, including laptops and internet access to those in need. However, the digital divide remains with nearly 40% of Bronx residents lacking access to the internet. More needs to be done to ensure that all adults who are seeking employment can access training programs remotely. Despite the turbulent market, demand for tech skills remains high. Over 330 of our graduates have obtained employment during the pandemic, earning a starting salary of $21 an hour, equating to a 4X increase in their average pre-training wages. However, there's more work to be done. The Bronx has a 17.5% unemployment rate, the highest in New York State. New Yorkers need programs like Prescolis now more than ever. Over the past few years, we have developed multiple pathways into our programs, including bridge training, which has seen hundreds of young adults enroll in our training who otherwise would not have qualified. These pathways are crucial as we have seen demand skyrocket for our programs by over 200%. Perscolis is a proud member of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, and I encourage the council to adopt the coalition's recommendations, including increasing investment in adult education, job training, and bridge programs. Workforce organizations are vital to the economic recovery of the city, and together we can put New Yorkers back to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendez. Next, we will hear from Sonam Choden, followed by Jessica Conway Pierce, and then Ken Small. Ms. Choden, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai, Chair Ballone, and committee members. My name is Sonam Choden, and I'm the Outreach and Member Success Manager at Hot Bread Kitchen. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Hot Bread Kitchen works with immigrants and women of color in the five boroughs. I work directly with the women we serve through our workforce program, and I can best illustrate the value of our services through a story about one of our members. Nafi Sata came to the U.S. from Burkina Faso in 2016. She came alone to East Harlem, leaving her husband behind to find economic opportunity and advancement in our city. Nafi joined our workforce program in 2017 and shared with us after a long and unfruitful job search that she felt she was being overlooked because of her because she's, she wears a headscarf. At Hot Bread Kitchen, she found a community of women who shared similar backgrounds and the same goal, gainful employment. Through our skills training, job placement, and well-established network of employers, Nafi landed a job through her hard work and our connections. Fast forward to the present day, Nafi is still a part of our community. She's one of over 200 of our program members to receive cash assistance, social service supports, technical assistance to access public benefits like unemployment, ongoing training, and job placement services since the pandemic started. Nafi was laid off in March, 
and with our support, went back to work in June. Our current work with Nafi is connecting her to reliable childcare through our partnerships and to another workforce member who has offered help. Nafi is representative of all the women we serve. They're immigrants primarily, they are working mothers, they're often single parents. They share an ambition to grow a career and become, as we like to say, breadwinners in their families. What they don't have is what so many of us take for granted, networks, opportunities, education, and connections. Our workforce program, like many in the city, provides so much more than just job training and placement. We provide a house of services to meet our members' needs, and we provide a home where they can come back to reach their goals. While we serve New Yorkers like NAFI, we also serve the city's employers. We connect them to candidates they wouldn't otherwise meet. We customize training and education to meet their specific needs and demands. We provide support services to their workers so they can stay at work and succeed. Because of this, we have served over 48 employers with 111 hires in 2019. Time and time again, we have heard, whenever we need a new I'm team inspired. member, our supervisors raise their hand to share, um, ask for a hot bread kitchen program graduate. Through our continued market research, we're able to remain flexible and adaptive. We sit at the intersection of employer partnerships and effective de development of workers. Our work doesn't end at job placement, rather when our members and our employer partners meet their full potential. And this is the critical work that needs our continued support and investment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Joden. Next, we will hear from Jessica Conway Pierce, followed by Ken Small, and then Lowell Hirschberger. Ms. Conway Pierce, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good morning. I'm sitting in for Jessica Conway Paris. Um, good morning to the distinguished members of the Committees on Economic Development and Small Business. My name is Christine James McKenzie, and I'm the Associate of Communications, Learning, and Policy at Jobs First New York City, a nonprofit intermediary that creates and advances solutions that breaks down barriers and transforms the system, supporting young adults in their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. The pandemic has drastically increased the number of young adults who are out of work and out of school, which is now at estimated at 27% to 34%, and that's between 259,000 and 324,000 young people. Any workforce and economic recovery strategy needs to take into account this population and the organizations that serve them. Jobs First New York recommends the following. I submitted a long version online. Um, our first recommendation is map in demand skills and partner with employers to develop new strategies to improve educational and training programs for young adults. It is imperative that young adults receive relevant training to meet the evolving job market. Bridge the digital divide. We need substantial investment in providing digital tools, training and support to our young people and their communities. Provide funding for mental health counseling and support. We recommend a network of community programs and advocates be given access to funds to support the health and well being of young adults and their families. Um, expand funding for critical programs and convert current funding to general operating support for at least the next year. Food assistance programs, academic support, and childcare assistance must be supplemented so that people can focus on upskilling and return to work. Stimulate entrepreneurship via local incubators and micro agents. SBS and the NYCDC must not simply support training out of work New Yorkers. They must also support new I'm and inspired. small businesses so that these enterprises are able to remain open. The challenges we recommend must be pliable and be rooted in the needs of the communities we serve. Any recovery strategy undertaken by the City Council, SBS, or NYCEDC should take into account these evolving needs of the communities. Thank you for listening to us today. Thank you, Christine, and for your patience too for waiting. Thank you, Ms. McKenzie. Next, we will hear from Ken Small, followed by Lowell Hirschberger, and then Janet Rodriguez. Mr. Small, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Committee chairs and members, thank you for convening this hearing. My name is Ken Small. I am the development director for Bronxworks, a New York City Employment and Training Coalition member, and one of several settlement houses that serve the 1.5 million people who call the Bronx home. The coronavirus has hit the Bronx economy like a nuclear blast, vaporizing jobs and wiping out scores of local businesses. The, employment, the unemployment rate for the Bronx since April has averaged about 21%. The rates over the last seven months are only matched by numbers witnessed during the Great Depression years of the 1930s. 
The pandemic has hit the Bronx economy hard because many Bronx re residents held jobs in the hospitality, food service, arts and entertainment, and in-person retail sectors. These are sectors that were completely shut down for much of the spring and summer with food service facing the possibility of another shutdown in a matter of days. The pandemic and subsequent economic freefall has forced Bronx Works in general and our workforce developments in particular to adapt. Overall, our organization has seen a fourfold increase in the number of persons seeking food pantry help. In addition to providing SNAP and food assistance, our pantries now provide referrals for mental health services, unemployment benefits, health insurance, and skills training. Our workforce development department, which has long provided job readiness training, employment placement assistment, assistance, financial literacy counseling, and post-secondary education referrals, now finds itself providing food assistance as well. And I see that my time is running short, uh, but I would like to say that many Bronx uh, residents have lost their jobs during the pandemic and uh, have many stressors that they have to deal with. Uh, there's a need for these stressors to be addressed and without relief, our new normal will look less like 2019 and more like 1933, the worst year of the Great Depression. Thank you, uh, Ken. Thank you. Because what Bronx Works does is God's work. I'm so familiar with you, and I'm not sure the other boroughs know exactly what you do day in and day out, and you've been doing it historically for years. Um, we're so fortunate to have you. And, and the borough of the Bronx is fortunate to have you. Thank you for being such a strong advocate, my dear. Thank you. Please don't Thank you, Councilman. reach out to me on any of the issues that you're going through. Well, Chair Ballone feels the same way. It's just not about the economic development uh, force that you have, the workforce, but the other services that you're providing. God bless you. Thank you. And we look Thank forward to chairs. continuing to work with you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Mr. Small. Next, we will hear from Lowell Hirschberger, followed by Janet Rodriguez, and then Susan Shear. Mr. Hirschberger, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Thank you for this opportunity. I am um, an East New York resident, leader of the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, and member of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and Jobs First NYC, which you've already heard from today. <laughs> Our neighborhood was one of the hardest hit in the current COVID-19 pandemic. Many businesses are closed and unemployment is hitting record levels as we've heard today across the city. But typically in our unemployment is five to 10 percent higher than the city average and the current crisis has only exacerbated this unjust disparity with an unemployment rate nearing 25 percent. I'm here to endorse the New York City Employment and Training Coalition's platform which, which has been articulated today as well as to highlight a local concern of neighborhood advocates who have organized the Coalition for Community Advancement. The group was first formed when the neighborhood was facing a massive rezone back in 2016. I'm here to say that the agreements made in that rezone process have not been kept. <clears throat> Developers are experiencing the benefits of the increased density, but the community has not received the benefit of jobs promised. We were promised by EDC that 3,900 jobs as part of a $16.7 million investment in the local IBZ would happen. I'm here to ask, where are the 3,900 jobs? We need EDC and, and the council to answer for the promises they made to our community. In July of 2020, the coalition created a platform for a just transition that called on city, state, and federal governments to achieve legislation that compensates and, and reparates for the decades long disinvestment of government and private interests, which contributed to the diminished lack of healthcare opportunities, healthy food options, safe and affordable housing, accessible lending, and economic opportunities that made East New York more vulnerable to the pandemic. This platform lays out priorities for both housing and economic justice for East New York. In economic justice, it calls for the preserving and strengthening our small businesses, access to a growing and changing economy, and preserving and strengthening our industrial sector. Our first priority is what I just mentioned, to demand accountability from the city and economic development corporate on their commitment to invest the 16.7 million. This is a time when we uh, desperately need um, training to help our young people and our residents uh, get back to work. 
It's a hardworking community that wants to be part of the, the um, reconstruction of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hirschberger. Next, we will hear from Janet Rodriguez, followed by Susan Shear, and then Andrea Bowen. Ms. Rodriguez, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Janet Rodriguez, co-founder of So Harlem and CEO. We're based in West Harlem, and So Harlem's mission is to create equitable opportunities through cultural industries workforce development, not simply because it's right, but because equity is essential to successful economic development in historically disenfranchised communities like ours, where unemployment rate is nearly double the national average. To, our, to achieve our mission, we incubate creative entrepreneurs while they launch their micro enterprises in Harlem. And we train under and unemployed residents in jobs needed to sustain them. In West Harlem, 21% of our neighbors in one in five, mostly women and children, still live below the poverty line. Our community has a disproportionate number of, high, of, of, of folks that were formerly incarcerated whose employment options are bleak. And according to NYU's Furman Center, the median household income is West, in West Harlem is about 23,000, which is significantly lower than the US average of 56,000. So Harlem provides workspace and training and basic sewing skills for under and unemployed residents. We aim to support the New York fashion and design ecosystem by providing a pool of workers to fill jobs left empty by the retirement of so many aging skilled workers. Trainees develop sewing skills, gain exposure from industry professionals and practical experience in our environment. So Harlem and Janice Properties, our primary, part, primary partners, share the desire of the community to address high unemployment in Manhattanville and to ensure that homegrown businesses and creative industry enterprises owned and staffed by local people are a central compo component of the redevelopment of the I'm factory expired. district. Last spring, we, we were able to Okay, if, we don't, if I don't have a lot of time left, I will tell you the most important thing. Due to So, to so Harlem, due to COVID-19 spiking in our zip code, we will be closing today, despite that this is the month of the holidays, which is the best time for our designers and micro enterprises to sell their wares. So we're pivoting to doing everything online. We're using this time to prepare and plan for opportunities to ensure our workforce is ready and able and expanding in 2021. And we implore the city to do the right thing. Thank you. Janet, thank you. Thank you, Janet. That, that's not news we want to hear. If there's anything that Councilmember Joe and I and I can do to make sure your doors stay open, please reach out to us. We will. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Uh, I've been speaking to SBS and this administration on advertising, educating, and promoting the importance of shopping locally. We know that when you, every dollar you spend in a local community, 67 cents of that dollar stays within that community. Uh, where I hope we'll have something soon uh, to SBS that'll help industries like yours and communities like yours that educate everyone if you like your commercial corridor, if you enjoy shopping at your local eatery or retailer, patronize them because they won't be there next year. That's and right. unfortunately, we're not doing enough of this. Uh, this is a beholden and it should be the responsibility of New York City to do more. So if you love New York City, shop in New York City is the logo and that should be the same. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Next, we will hear from Susan Shear, followed by Andrea Bowen, and then Rebecca Lurie. Ms. Shear, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Susan Shear, and I am the CEO of ICD, Institute for Career Development, and a member of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Founded over 100 years ago to rehabilitate wounded World War I soldiers, ICD is a New York City-based nonprofit that provides vocational assessment, training, 
and job placement free of charge to individuals with a broad array, array of disabilities ages 14 and up. Even before COVID, unemployment rates for individuals with disabilities were unacceptably high. During the longest economic expansion on record, 70% of individuals with disabilities weren't in the workforce and the unemployment rate was two and a half times that of individuals without a disability. Often among the last hired and in entry level service roles, individuals with disabilities were among the first to lose their jobs in this downturn. Others were forced to give up employment because the nature of their disability placed them at a higher risk for COVID related complications should they contract the virus. To be clear, as a person with a disability myself, I can tell you that individuals with disabilities want to work. They come to our organization for services even now uh, to advance and get themselves ready for the uptick. One in five individuals has a disability. Post COVID, that number will surely rise as many of our fellow New Yorkers experience lasting health impacts from the virus. These so-called long haulers will need organizations like ICD who can help them get back to work. Despite the extreme level of need, assessment and training services accessible to individuals with disabilities are largely missing from the city's current workforce development programs funded by agencies such as SBS and EDC. State and federally funded vocational rehabilitation programs, while vital to the workforce development ecosystem, do not meet the needs of all New Yorkers. Right. With the status quo needs to change and it needs to change now. When you are already considered quote unquote, not normal, back to normal is definitely not good enough. We can start by welcoming individuals with disabilities and community-based providers that have expertise in preparing individuals with disabilities for employment to the planning table as we look to, towards recovery. Thank you, one finish? Sure, thanks. All right, to borrow from the show Hamilton, we want to be in the room where it happens. At this historic moment, the disability community, my community, is eager to be part of rebuilding New York City's economy. We look to the council to ensure that the new normal is one that embraces disability, equity, and full inclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Yes, yeah, so we're going to have to change that to the virtual room where it happens. One of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite lines in there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Next, we will hear from Andrea Bowen, followed by Rebecca Lurie, and then Sylvia Morse. Ms. Bowen, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Andrea Bowen, principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. Thank you, Chair Vallone, Chair Jonai, council members and committee staff for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, or NICNOC, um, and I'm also informed by experience of other clients and advocacy work. Worker cooperatives provide a unique opportunity to simultaneously provide New Yorkers with not just jobs, but ownership and accordingly management of the very places they work. Several of my colleagues, including Rebecca Lurie testifying after me and Sadaf Sayal of NICNOC will speak more to this when they testify. Um, I come to work with NICNOC from a vantage point informed by um, working with worker co-ops, also being a transgender woman and advocate at an activist, and also advocating and co-designing workforce programs. Um, I helped um, design uh, Unity Works, a workforce program for LGBTQ runaway and homeless youth, which is a partnership between the Unity Project, DYCD, and the Center for Youth Employment. Um, and in helping develop this program, I spoke with youth and advocates alike about what they would want to get out of it. And one of the things that they wanted as uh, career goals was learning about entrepreneurship. Um, worker cooperatives provide this. Um, worker cooperatives, Nick Knock and its partners um, have created programs to train people across the age span, um, young adults as, as well as folks after older than 25, to create and run their own businesses. Um, and worker cooperatives are an especially successful model for building ownership among uh, folks in Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, and the appeal for worker cooperatives for LGBTQ people is not hard to fathom. Um, you know, LGBTQ people, including transgender folks, um, face disproportionate unemployment rates, as we generally know. Um, the one issue here is that a lot of funding streams, especially federal streams, limit what workforce programs can do, which is why city tax levy should be used to help integrate workforce programs 
and worker cooperative uh, training programs. And I'll reserve the rest of my time for my colleagues. Andrea, thank you so much. And I love the decorations. As you can see, I'm surrounded by my house decorations. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Next, we will hear from Rebecca Lurie and then Sylvia Morse, followed by Sadoof Sayal. Ms. Lurie, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good morning or afternoon, and thank you, Chairs Vallone and Yone. My name is Rebecca Lurie. I am the founder of the Community and Worker Ownership Project at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Last spring, I was invited to join the Mayor's COVID Recovery Advisory Council for Labor and Workforce Development. We now convene a working group on cooperative solutions aimed to explore innovative solutions with these industry representatives and partners. In partnership with the Cooperative Industry Business Association, New York City Network of Worker Co-ops, we over time have designed instruction for workers to become cooperative owners from work workforce education to college. We have learned where there are barriers to deliver cooperative business education. When workforce development funding is used for job training and placement, there is a misfit for worker owners of small firms who will not hit the traditional milestones used for workforce development of a pay stub in 90 days. Collaborating on an endeavor to run and operate companies offers past people a pathway to personal fulfillment and agency that cannot be measured by a paycheck alone. This cannot be underestimated when genuinely considering DEI initiatives, initiatives that are aimed for diversity, equity, and inclusion. When occurring in communities of color, we lay the groundwork that can untether them from the economy that for too long has come with exploitation and exclusion. COVID has made challenges to the business, small businesses huge. The gigification of work in too many sectors has risen as a business solution that is intended only to extract wealth of labor for investors. Keeping talent and profit in the, co in the company and the community serves as a multiplier effect for community development and community well-being. Our EDC needs to look at real estate as an asset to unleash towards this multiplier. By many accounts, the largest barrier to equity in our city is real estate. We need to unleash property to support cooperative businesses, knowing that a stated purpose of these businesses is to serve local economies and the people who work there. Our mayor just announced required. owners to owners, thank you. And this will support business owners to sell to their workers. There needs to be training in place that will support that in Denver. Finally, I'd like to say we need to tie economic development and workforce training together with property uses and access to training and education that support the type of small businesses that cooperatives represent for the people, by the people, with democratic control at its core that stay in place. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Ms. Lurie. Next, we will hear from Sylvia Morse, followed by Sadouf Sayal, and then Alisado Coronado Hernandez. Ms. Morse, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chairpersons Joe Nye and Vallone and distinguished members of New York City Council Committees on Small Business and Economic Development. My name is Sylvia Morris and I'm Assistant Director in the Cooperative Development Program at Center for Family Life, a 42-year-old social services organization in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. CFL has been part of the Council-supported Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative since its start in 2014, through which we provide tailored and long-term technical assistance and training to immigrant and women workers to run their own cooperative businesses in service sectors such as cleaning and childcare. Our workforce development services also include job readiness and placement assistance through our adult employment program. CFL supported cooperatives have generated over $15 million and helped stabilize families of more than 500 workers. Worker owners in the cooperative uh, businesses we support are primarily immigrant women who are English language learners and parents. As small business owners, these workers create better jobs, typically seeing their hourly wages double and establish a path to their family's economic stability and build knowledge and skills to take on leadership positions in their businesses and communities. The pandemic and economic crisis, however, has presented significant challenges. The cleaning cooperatives we support saw an approximately 40% drop in the number of jobs in March, 2020 compared to previous months and then 100% loss of income in April through June due to stay-at-home orders and safety precautions. But during that time, CFL worked quickly to adapt our technical assistance and training to remote work, including additional tech coaching to workers and new COVID-19 uh, work safety trainings by OSHA certified trainers. The cooperatives developed new safety procedures, added new lines of business, and even recruited and trained more workers. 
As a result, cooperatives and their worker owners are seeing monthly job volume at about 60% of that before the pandemic, and year-to-date sales are around 80% of what they were this time last year. These numbers reflect cooperatives' resiliency, but also the need for ongoing support as these workers and their communities weather this economic crisis. I'm expired. Uh, just to, if I could briefly finish, just to say that cooperatives are an essential workforce development strategy at CFL, our adult employment program, and cooperative development programs work together. We've done joint industry-specific training um, and ESL courses, and we think there's tremendous opportunity for this kind of collaboration, and we also urge continued support for WCBDI in fiscal year 22. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morse. Next, we will hear from Sadouf Sayal, followed by Alisalda Coronado Hernandez. Uh, as a note to the sergeants, Ms. Coronado Hernandez will ha have a translator, um, and so we will give her four minutes so she and the translator can complete their testimony together. The first, we'll hear from Sadouf Sayal. Mr. Sayal, you may begin when the sergeants call. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sadaf Sial, and I'm with the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, also known as NICNAC. Uh, we are a trade association that represents worker co-op businesses across New York City, that, uh, which are overwhelmingly owned and controlled by women, immigrants, and people of color. Uh, I'm also here today on behalf of the 13 organizations that comprise the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, or WCBDI, uh, which, as you may know, is funded through city council discretionary funds. We would like to urge the city to support worker cooperatives, um, to con continue to support WCBDI through FY22, and really to see worker co-ops as a critical solution for workforce development, as well as economic development. Um, prior to joining NICNOC, I had worked for a community-based organization where I spent seven years building a workforce program to meet the needs of Latinx communities across Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Um, it didn't take much time to understand how broken the workforce system and overall economic system were, how disconnected it was from immigrant communities, and how it failed fundamentally to value workers. We, like some other programs, eventually turned to worker co-ops as a solution for better jobs for people in our communities. Worker co-ops really address issues of inequity and injustice that many workers face, from low wages to wage theft and discrimination. Um, and really they create jobs that tend to be longer term, offer extensive skills trainings and provide better wages. Worker co-ops can and do exist in any industry from food to fashion, cleaning and childcare to manufacturing and they are inclusive to all. The ongoing pandemic has further exposed and exacerbated the issues in, of inequity in our economy and has led more people to think about alternative solutions like co-ops. In this time, worker co-ops can also help save businesses and jobs by converting traditional businesses to worker ownership. So the new owner to owner conversion hotline created by the mayor alongside supportive WCBDI are really good first steps to supporting worker co-ops. Just a couple of really quick points um, that in addition, as also mentioned that we believe that uh, worker develop, uh, workforce development resources are extremely important and that those should include training and skills building around worker ownership and education for workers to become worker owners. And to think even bigger, we believe that space should be made available for these models to exist and thrive for everyone. Um, and you know, you know, that in addition to workforce one-stop centers, that there's community-led worker cooperative training uh, and education centers. Um, so with all of that, we hope to continue to work with the city to support this model for worker ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sayal. Uh, next up will be Ali Salda Coronado Hernandez and her interpreter. Um, so again, they will be on a four minute timer. Uh, after them will be Megan Nylon and then Lydia Edmonds followed by Terrence Byerson. Uh, Ms. Coronado Hernandez, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Muy buenas tardes, miembros del Consejo de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Alizalda Coronado. Soy proveedora de cuidado infantil familiar del Bronx. Primero, les invito a escuchar una importante lista de palabras, como son comunidad, esencial, trabajadores esenciales, padres y tutores, educador de la primera infancia, cuidador, bebés, niños pequeños, niños, trabajo duro, proveedor, aprendizaje a distancia, la fuerza de trabajo. Okay, um, 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you got to speak in, in short sentences so I can translate. Tú tienes que eh, hablar en eh, oraciones pequeñas para poder, poder traducir, porque la información es mucha y se va a quedar. Yo le desearía, le pido que si puede empezar otra vez. Perfecto. Soy proveedora de cuidado infantil familiar del Bronx. Ok, I'm a provider for our children care in the Bronx. Les invito a escuchar una lista de palabras importantes relacionadas a mi trabajo. I invite you to listen to a list of uh, important words related to my job. Comunidad. Community. Esencial. Essential. Trabajadores esenciales. Uh, essential workers. Padres y tutores. Father, parents and tutors. Educador de la primera infancia. Educator of, of the first uh, inf infancy. Cuidador. Uh, take care of it. Bebés. Children, babies. Niños pequeños. Uh, little children. Trabajo duro. Hard work. Aprendizaje a distancia. Uh, distance remote learning. La fuerza de trabajo. The force of work. The todas, son, of work. todas son palabras que significan tanto. Uh, todas all of them are words that signify a lot. Todas estas palabras muestran cómo una comunidad prospera. Okay, all those words show how a community uh, thrive. Cómo funciona y cómo se sostiene económicamente. How it works, uh, how it supports itself financially. Vengo a ustedes hoy para pedirles que nos unamos para un bien mayor. I am here today to ask you to get uh, together and united for the common good. De los niños, de las familias y la comunidad. Uh, uh, the good of the children, the families, and the community. Vengo a ustedes hoy para dar una voz de alarma como cuidadora uh, infantil. I'm here to, uh, to get as a voice of alarm, alert, uh, as a, a take as a, a taking care of children. Mis colegas y yo estamos proporcionando cuidado enriquecedor. Okay, um, my colleagues and myself are offering a, 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 a enrichment. Estimul y estimulante para los niños más vulnerables de nuestra ciudad. Okay, and uh, motivational for the children that are more uh, vulnerable of the city. Incluidos los niños pequeños. Including the small children. Los niños con necesidades especiales y niños sin hogar. Uh, the children with the special needs and the homeless children. ¿Quedamos con el tiempo o permiten más tiempo? Ok, uh, did I use my time or can I go on? Thank you, Alessandra. If, if you could kind of wrap up a little bit, but you have some more time. Ok, sí, tenemos un poco de tiempo, pero no mucho. Gracias, si porque es la, la introducción, básicamente, lo que acabo de presentarles. Voy a ir okay. directamente okay. al punto. I'm going straight to the point. Okay. Especialmente los proveedores independientes, estamos experimentando. Uh, especially unas... the individual uh, providers are experiencing... Falta de comunicación clara de las agencias públicas. Ok, lack of communication, lack of clear communication with the public agencies. Incluyendo la ausencia sobre una guía de salud durante el brote de la primavera pasada. Uh, including a lack of guidance uh, during, uh, during the last uh, spring. La falta de coordinación entre los organismos reguladores. Okay, the lack of coordination among the uh, uh, regulating agencies. Menores ingresos por la matrícula al practicar el distanciamiento social. 
pero mayores costos operativos. Okay, uh, less income because we got to keep the social distance, but uh, more costs uh, related to operations. Financiación insuficiente en cuanto a las tasas básicas y aumento de los gastos de funcionamiento relacionados con la pandemia. Okay, uh, la, you know, lack of financing and uh, uh, increase in expenses uh, because of the pandemic. Recomendamos lo siguiente. We recommend the following. Desarrollar un enfoque coordinado para apoyar la salud, la seguridad y la sostenibilidad del family shelter. Okay, um, the effort uh, to keep, uh, and uh, can you repeat again, uh, sorry, the three words? Desarrollar uh, salud, seguridad y la sostenibilidad. Okay. Okay, uh, to improve the health, uh, the, uh, uh, the safety, and the sustainable, and making it sustainable. Comunicarse regularmente con las empresas de cuidado infantil en formatos claros y accesibles en su lenguaje. Okay, uh, uh, more communication with the agency of um, uh, caring for children and being uh, clear and uh, communicating in the right language. El no compartir, no sería el, el correcto lenguaje, sino el lenguaje, la disponibilidad de los lenguajes que tiene la ciudad, todos los idiomas. Okay, she said that, that you know, provide this information on all the languages uh, that, that are in the city. Ofrecer subsidios que se adapten a las necesidades de los proveedores de cuidado infantil y otras okay. empresas en, en, que, que trabajan desde el hogar. Ok, uh, to provide subsidies uh, for the, all these uh, organizations that they care of children and other uh, businesses. Adoptar, procesos, adoptar procesos de solicitud racionalizados, o sea, permitir la máxima flexibilidad en el gasto, de modo que podamos pagar la deuda. Okay, allow maximum flexibility. Uh, so in order for us to pay what we owe, our debt. Hacer que los fondos estén disponibles por adelantado. And to make the funds available in advance. La mayoría de mis colegas no pueden adelantar nuestros propios fondos para pagar facturas en este momento. Okay, the, the majority of my colleagues uh, don't have access to those fund, funds uh, to pay for what they owe. Y finalmente les recomendamos que no le den la espalda a la comunidad, a los padres, que son la fuerza okay. laboral de esta ciudad. Okay, and finally we ask you, please don't turn your back on the parents because uh, they are the major force, the major labor force in the community. Haciéndolo se le hace a los niños pequeños y a nosotros que, que los cuidamos mientras ellos trabajan. Ok, to doing that, are you going to benefit the small children and us that take care of the children while they work? En gracias por su tiempo. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Um, before you jump off, I'd just like to request that the interpreter, could you please ask Ms. Coronado Hernandez to email her written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Ok, testimony. Ok, señora, ellos quieren que usted eh, le mande el testimonio que usted ha dado por correo electrónico. Uh, and, uh, and what is that again? Council? It's a testimony. Testimony. At council.nyc.gov. Ok, sí, que lo mande a testimonio, arroba, Uh, cancel y después de, uh, that go, uh, punto gov. Ok, voy a confirmar. Testimony terminado en Y at council.gov. Council.nyc.gov. That AYC punto N Y C punto G O V. Ok. Perfecto. Lo puedo Perfecto. traducir en inglés también. Para I can translate. No... I can mm -hmm. uh, translate it to English, so in order for you to understand. Great. Gracias. Thank you so much. 
Okay, muchas gracias. Uh, next, we will hear from Megan Nyland, followed by Lydia Edmonds, and then Terence Byerson. Ms. Nyland, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you to the chairs, city council, and fellow panelists for everything you're doing to help unemployed New Yorkers. My name is Megan Nylon, resident of Washington Heights and current graduate student at CUNY. I'm also an avid gardener and here to speak about the 5,000 acres of unused land in New York City that can be used for urban agriculture and farm economies. Earlier this year, the city council passed Local Law 40, a 10-year food policy plan that includes developing and improving food and farm economies. Urban agriculture can generate revenue and provide long-term employment for our communities, in addition to plenty of part-time employment for students and youth and working opportunities for disabled New Yorkers. Urban farming also provides a COVID-friendly working environment as employees can easily socially distance outside while performing their tasks. In 2018, Intro 1058 called for the development of a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. In order to generate more jobs through urban agriculture, the city should establish a committee of, on urban agriculture to catalog available land and provide resources and materials to community members to start their own farming businesses. New York City should also make it easier for those already gardening to retain income earned on city owned land. Many community gardeners are immigrants, communities of color, and nature residents, and they deserve to earn income from their labor. I urge the city council to consider urban agriculture development as one way to support economic growth and equity in our communities. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Nyland. Next, we will hear from Lydia Edmonds, followed by Terrence Byerson, followed by Antu Nguyen. Ms. Edmonds, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Council members and committee staff, thank you for your time today. My name is Dia Edmonds. I have a degree in labor studies and I'm currently a student researcher at the CUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy. I'm here today to, to discuss issues of workforce equity that are being overlooked by Resolution 1320-2020 which calls on the USDA to expand the kind of retailers permitted in the SNAP online purchasing program. The objective is to ensure vulnerable communities in New York City can safely access healthy food by ordering online for delivery. This program itself depends on a vulnerable, often marginalized workforce as the crucial link in delivering groceries to New York City's elderly, disabled, and other SNAP participants. The primary online retailers in this program currently are not small businesses, they are Amazon and Walmart, global corporations not required to disclose how much of their revenue is from their very own employees needing to use SNAP benefits. Qualified retailers along the supply chain, including warehouses and delivery service providers and platforms must be held accountable to meet standards of fair pay in order to receive SNAP dollars. This is essential during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Otherwise, we are feeding SNAP recipients off the backs of marginalized and exploited workers who themselves end up requiring SNAP benefits if they dare apply. Today, as you consider the implications for small business, economic development, workforce development, and unemployment, please consider the labor of delivery workers and why this is not being addressed by the USDA. This resolution must be amended to hold the USDA accountable. The pilot's current design will only exacerbate the very issues like low wages that make food inaccessible in the first place. I urge the co-sponsors present to amend Resolution 1320-2020, bring it out of committee and to the floor for a vote. This resolution must require retailer transparency and fair labor practices to be consistent with the track record and values the New York City I'm Council sorry. works so hard for. New York City can lead the way in ensuring local, state, and federal policies do not continue to perpetuate poverty. Thank you for your time and solidarity. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Terrence Byerson, followed by Antun Nguyen, followed by MJ Okma. Mr. Byerson, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Valone, Chair Gonage, and members of the council. 
and thank you for holding today's important hearing on workforce development. My name is Terrence Byerson and I am the Community Relations Manager at Strive, one of New York's leading workforce providers for those that have encountered barriers to employment. Our motto has propelled thousands of New Yorkers into upward mobility and economic stability by empowering our students to employment that leads to careers and not just jobs, while providing the essential social supports necessary to sustain employment. Since 1984, thousands of New Yorkers have come to strive in order to improve their, life, their way of life. 98% of these individuals are from underserved black and brown communities throughout the city and have experienced food and housing insecurity, criminal justice involvement, and little or no job and education skills. These prevent major challenges as it pertains to job opportunities. In 2019, we achieved a 91% graduation rate and maintained a 70% placement and retention rate. During the pandemic, programs never stopped at Strive as we immediately realized that we had to pivot in our approach to our service delivery. And we did that within a week. The black and brown communities that we serve have been devastated by the pandemic. And we felt obligated to continue our services to assess our Strive family. We provided laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots to our participants. We conducted closed drives, distributed hot meals to the community, and also had a turkey drive. On top of that, we contacted over 4,000 alumni to assess their needs and help navigate unemployment. While placing over 360 alumni in employment and sending over 900 individuals on interviews. In 2021, Strive is, um, in 2021, Strive is not slowing down and providing much needed resources and exemplary service to our community and as students. As the world changes, Strive will move with it helping our graduates come out of the pandemic e even better than they were in early 2020. However, as my colleagues have stated today, we need the city council's continued and expanded partnership to help the communities we serve. The council has proven that they believe in our work and we are grateful to that partnership. And we would like to build on that strong relationship in order to support our communities. Such services are even more vital during this time of uncertainty. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Byerson. Next, we will hear from Antu Nguyen, followed by MJ Okma, and then Kayana Beckles. Ms. Nguyen, you be, may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, chairs, council members, and staff. My name is Antu Nguyen, and I am Director of Strategic Partnerships at Democracy at Work Institute, which was created to expand access to worker ownership for communities affected by economic and social injustice. On behalf of the 13 organizations making up the New York City Council-funded Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, WCBDI, thank you for the opportunity to speak to our achievements and emphasize how worker ownership can ensure good jobs and good work and resiliency in this time. The South Bronx has for 35 years been home to a national model for high road workforce development and the largest worker cooperative in the country, uh, Cooperative Home Care Associates. Uh, CHDA has tra transformed a traditionally low wage, high turnover, yet crucially important sector, home health care for the better, raising job quality and industry standards through worker ownership and with continuous investment in on the job training and skills development from recruitment to training to placement employment. Now with over 2000 staff, the vast majority women and immigrants of color, all essential workers working during the COVID-19 pandemic, CHDA has produced incredible workforce development results as a worker owned business. Of the 600 30 job seekers enrolled annually, 94% of them graduate with a portable credential and 85% are employed as home health aides. Of those, 68% remain employed after one year. All of those who graduate from the embedded training program are guaranteed a job and eventually a part of this, a stake with, uh, with CHDA as a worker owner. In comparison, according to the National Benchmarking Project, Similar low income training programs on average secure employment for only 29% of, of enrollees and of those just 38% remain employed after one year. New York City Council's investment in worker ownership is a national model for creating sustainable economic development, good jobs and good work with cities including Boston, Philadelphia, and Madison following our lead. We believe that it's critical to continue this work that we're doing to support small businesses and create good jobs, primarily in immigrant communities and communities of color to keep I'm them create new opportunities for high road work, offer a means to build and root wealth in neighborhood and communities and sustain and grow the diversity of small businesses and good jobs in New York City. 
I thank the city council for the opportunity to testify. We ask the city council to further support for WCBD and worker co-ops as a critical part of worker de workforce development and the essential long-term economic recovery work that will be needed in the year to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nguyen. Next, we will hear from MJ Okma and then Kiana Beckles, followed by Teresha Flermond. Uh, MJ Okma, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is MJ Okuma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing 170 human services providers in New York City. We're here today to discuss combating unemployment. It must be stressed that New York City's essential human services workforce has suffered a net loss of 44,000 jobs since February. This net loss is the highest of any essential industry and is the direct result of cuts to human services at the city and state level, including the dangerous um, city cuts to the indirect cost initiative, and lack of support from the federal government. This massive job loss is not only devastated to the affecting human services workers and their colleagues, but also to the city as a whole. Not having a strong and fully funded human services sector undermines the scope and impact of essential services during a time of growing need and sets our city's recovery back. City human services contracts were underfunded by 20% pre-COVID-19 and that gap is only growing. The city is not getting a deal by chronically underfunding these essential services, is being dependent on low wage workers to fill the gaps. These workers are 80%, 82% women and 80% people of color. And pay is so low that 60% of the human services workforce qualified for public assistance before our city even saw their first case of COVID. It is in the financial interest of New York City to reverse course and invest in the sector. Programs like supportive housing, job training, food assistance, and childcare help the communities most impacted by the pandemic regain their footing. This includes vital workforce development providers we have heard from today who are running education and training programs for displaced workforces and communities hardest hit by COVID-19. New York City cannot address our workforce development needs in high unemployment numbers in the wake of COVID-19 without fully funding human services. In order to support recovery in communities of color that have been most impacted by this pandemic, funding for essential human services jobs and programs must be restored and bolstered. As we emerge from this crisis, one of our city's top priorities must be to invest in the human services workforce. And without action, it will only be more difficult for our city I'm to expired. expand. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Okma. Next, we will hear from Kiana Beckles, followed by Teresha Flermond, and then Cynthia Trevor. Ms. Beckles, you may begin when the sergeants call time. I had a contact with the Flores, who is here today, um, who sits on the. Uh, will the muter please unmute Ms. Beckles? Oh, there she is. Hey, did you call my name? Um, yes. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to multitask. Um, Okay, my name is Kiana Beckles. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Leverage Assessments, uh, also the uh, co-founder of the Black Government Contracting Club, uh, also the chair for the Black Scenario Law Enforcement Task Force. Um, the, what I'm gonna speak to you about today is um, my work in testing candidates. So my company, Leverage Assessments, we are in MWBE city certified and state certified. Um, locally located business. Um, we are located in the Bronx. We test candidates out of the Bronx. Um, and we have utilized in the past the city's workforce development programs, including um, summer youth, as well as the interns from, city, from CUNY Central. Um, those programs disappeared this summer, which was definitely a blow, um, but we are prepared to host interns whenever they come back remotely. We've transitioned everything so that we do, we do everything remotely. Um, and as a professional services company, we're prepared to test candidates remotely and to um, host interns remotely. And I think that there is a program coming back that's designed to link interns with MWBs and that sort of thing. And that's great, I've signed up for that. Um, DCAS stopped testing for city jobs in March. Um, we have to continue testing people for jobs because we can do it remotely. Um, one, although one of the biggest challenges to testing candidates for jobs remotely is internet accessibility, particularly for candidates that are in uh, those low income neighborhoods. Candidates who are testing for city jobs are generally in the, in the lower socioeconomic category. They come from all areas of the city, they are sometimes immigrants. They are sometimes new to the US, um, but they are 
super strong part of our economy. Um, and once they test for those jobs, they generally are on a waiting list for about two years um, before they actually get, before they get hired. So I'll say that my, my primary recommendation is really about shortening the time from testing to hire for city jobs. I think that that's one of the most critical things about making our, our city programs more effective. For people who are in that lower income category, they cannot wait for two years to get a job. You cannot wait for two years for a program to come out. By the time that program comes out, it's irrelevant. Thank you, Ms. Beckles. Next, we will hear from Teresha Flermond, followed by Cynthia Trevor, and then Osman Mariano. As a reminder to anybody who remains who'd like to testify, if you have not heard your name called, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Ms. Flermond, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Council members, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Teresha Thurman. I am a master's student at CUNY School of Public Health and a qualified nutritionist. Vulnerable communities in New York City are combating more than just the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Data from the CDC suggests that serious illness resulting from the COVID-19 disproportionately affects people and communities of color due to the underlying health and economic challenges that they face. RES 1320 2020 is calling for the USDA to expand the number of retailers that are permitted in the SNAP online purchasing program to ensure vulnerable communities in New York City can safely access healthy food. The SNAP program helps combat food insecurity by offering nutrition assistance to millions of eligible low income individuals individuals and families and by providing economic benefits to communities. Currently, SNAP payments online is only allowed for Amazon, ShopRite, and Walmart in New York. Pushing for this resolution will help control the spread by reducing physical contact and will help stimulate the economy um, in those neighborhoods by creating jobs for safe, healthy food delivery. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted small businesses in profound and unprecedented ways. Economic development was difficult to achieve this year, and this with the talks of a uh, second wave, small businesses have more concerns. With most people staying home, the foot traffic they rely on is almost non-existent. This resolution will impact sustainability and improve like livelihood and those communities that are at a greater risk while also preparing for more wide range and resilient food system. I ask that you support resolution 1320-2020 by calling on the USDA to revise the SNAP online pilot program to preferentially support local food businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flerman. Uh, it looks like Cynthia Trevor, Trevor has jumped off, so we will move on to our final panelist. Uh, Osman Mariano, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, I'd like to first start by thanking this committee and all your city council colleagues and staff for your truly heroic work to ensure the continued survival of our city. While I do appreciate and I'm thankful for the city's response to COVID-19 pandemic, other city business must continue. Small businesses are uniquely positioned to develop and quickly innovate, quickly implement innovative re recovery solutions. They need your support. Hello, my name is Osman Mariano. I'm a graduate student at CUNY School of Public Health. I'm here to give support and bring attention to City Council Resolution 007-2018 that urges the state and legislature, the state legislature and the government to pass and sign into law the creation of a definition of honey and create uniform standards for its sale. Using an equity lens, regulations and markets can be bridged. In 2010, New York City legalized beekeeping. As of 2016, there were 300 beekeepers. This small yet vibrant community needs your support. Bolstering New York's broadly supported $100 million honey industry is an innovative approach that can add to New York's economic recovery. With a global market of $2.3 billion, honey is the third most baked food in the world. Every year, 600 pounds of honey are consumed in the US. That's about a billion dollars. U.S. honey consumption has increased 30% in the past decade. Last per capita, New York is the largest honey producer in the Northeast, the 10th in the nation, and yet there's no precise definition nor regulatory standards for honey. 
better regulations increase consumer protection and confidence and facilitate the creation of new jobs and additional resources for municipal income. This market also needs, this market also adds to the much needed infrastructure for New York. New York City Council Resolution 0071-201 is the first good step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mariano. Um, one last reminder, if there's anybody who would like to testify who has not had the opportunity to do so, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no additional hands raised, uh, we will now turn to the chair for closing remarks. Chair Vallone, you may start. There we go. Well, thank you for the many, many participants for today's hearing, to my co-chair, uh, Councilmember Mark Joni, and to everyone who stayed till the end. Um, this is a topic that is much larger than the four hours we delved into it. In the EDC realm and the hearings, we have been going on over the COVID pandemic since March, and every hearing we have held has been to redirect the city agency's forces, funding, and attention into the pandemic we are in now and that we so desperately want to get out of. Um, we are doing that. We are meeting uh, on a daily basis to do that. And I'd like to thank again, uh, my amazing staff that put this together and my own district staff, my chief of staff, Jonathan Shutt, my new legislative council, uh, Kevin, and I've met Susie and Kate and everyone, Christine at the office that makes this run so smoothly for me uh, and our entire team wishing everyone a blessed and happy new year, happy holidays, uh, and the spirit of the, the man upstairs to guide over us, heal us, and make us um, the great city that we once were once again. God bless everyone, thank you. Sure, I just chimed back in. I, I apologize, I'm double zooming, and I wanted to just follow up and say thank you um, as a co-chair, uh, economic development and small business. Uh, we work closely hand in hand, the uh, economic turmoil that uh, is ahead of us is going to require all hands on deck. I'm so proud to be working alongside of you. I want to thank all of those that testified um, and were so patient uh, to wait. Thank you because what you say is important and it resonates. Uh, we, this information is gathered and then we start looking for solutions and actual legislation that can help address the issues that you have brought up. And I'll just end by wishing you all a happy holidays, a healthy, peaceful, and safe New Year. God bless you and thank you. With that, we bring the meeting to a close. <laughs>